Thank you. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. The Baltimore County Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff in accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19. The board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act, being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's board meeting, excuse me, as a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as requesting discussion on an agenda item. So the next item on the agenda is the presentation on the superintendent's proposed FY 2022 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Saris. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Could you state your name, please? Who is speaking? Hello? This was Miss Hen, but I'll defer to Miss Causey. Oh, sir. OK, I only heard one voice. Yes. Um, is there a question? Yes. Good evening, Madam Chair. This is Miss Causey. I apologize. Uh, somehow I just was kicked out and I got back in. Uh, but I um, am making a motion to amend the agenda for this evening per the board's directive that in every open session of the board, there will be an item uh, to discuss reopening of schools. And actually, I'm not looking for a motion. I'm looking for direction from the board council who had previously informed the full board that uh, that should be the case. Um, if I could also um, chime in on that, I believe the motion for the previous meeting was to have just the agenda item be forwarded that we would discuss the um, presentation of the operating budget. So as far as I understand it, having the reopening wasn't applicable to this meeting because we it was based on a motion that we discussed the um the operating budget um uh, mr brusades are you there to chime in on that yes i'm here uh okay my, my, my understanding of the uh standing agenda item regarding reopening of schools was for regular meetings and not necessarily work sessions. So I would have to uh, have somebody go back to the minutes uh, when that motion was originally brought up to see how it was phrased. Madam Chair. And that was my understanding too, that it was our regular meetings and that the motion, this is a work session so that we would, so that it wouldn't be applicable at this meeting. Madam Chair. Yes, who's speaking, please? If everyone could state their name, because we are in a virtual environment, so I'm not able to see who is speaking. This is Miss Hen. Thank you. The, yes, Miss Hen. Yes, the motion that Mrs. Causey refers to um, referred to every open session that the first item of unfinished business was to be the reopening. So I believe she is correct. And Miss Rowe did um, include um, the language. The motion stated all open session meetings. And the motion that scheduled this work session um, was to schedule it as a meeting. Since we are in open session, then the motion um, that the board passed does apply to um, the agenda item that Mrs. Causey references. Uh, Mr. Bercidis, is that correct? Because this is a work session, not in, um, uh, it, I mean, it is an open session, but it is a work session. So is that applicable to this meeting? 
If the language that I'm hearing uh, for the motion, prior motion, if that was all open session meetings, then that would appear to encompass tonight's work session. So that um, the reopen or the open to the so basically, what is the motion, please? If we could restate that, because I, I it wasn't emailed over in advance, so I have no idea what the motion is. Madam Chair, um, this is Ms. Hen. The original motion did include the language all open session meetings, and Mr. Mercedes previously ruled on this, providing the advice that it did include work sessions as those are open session meetings. Okay, so what is the motion that uh, Ms. Causey made? She is not making a motion. She is seeking um, confirmation that the first item of unfinished business should be the reopening of schools. And was that a part of the motion that was originally made? That is the first that it needs to be the first item. Yes, Madam Chair. I don't have that motion here. Um, I'm trying to look now to see because I would need that. I would need that motion in writing because I that was made at a prior board meeting and I don't have that here, so I don't know what that is. It's a standing um, motion. I'm happy to look up that wording for you. Mr. Mercedes ruled on it previously in the same um, circumstances. So this is why I'd ask for motions to be sent over in advance because of unnecessary um, time lag is what we're having now with with um, uh, yes. conversation in regards to things and we have quite a bit of information to get to and we need to process this budget and discussing motions that were not sent over in advance that we are un um, uh, unfamiliar with uh, really um, is is a hindrance to our public and um, to uh, the well running and organization of our meeting. So that's that's I, I apologize to the public. It's quite unfortunate. I'm very sorry. This was so, a motion that was previously passed by the board and it okay. was provided in advance when it was originally made. Yeah, but that's why I've asked for it to be provided in advance and it was not. And so now we are where we are and we're now we're um, yeah, unfortunately. And OK, so um, I will restate the motion. It says the board unanimously approved to add reopening of schools as a standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully opened to all students for full time in person instruction. Is that the motion that you were referencing? Yes, Madam Chair. Oh. OK, so what we are saying is, is that we would like that at the beginning to discuss that um, prior to going into the operating budget, which we so really need to get into and discuss. I'm asking a question. The person who made the uh, motion, I'm asking the question of that. Who made who um, brought this up? Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Now I can. I could not before, but I can now. OK, thank you. Yes, there's some <clears throat> technical difficulty with uh, my um, I, Yes, I was asking for a point of order to clarify what was a standing board. Uh, directive, uh, so <clears throat> I'm asking that the directive be. Um, honored and agenda item for reopening of schools be added. OK, fine, let's go ahead and discuss it. So that is the first item on the agenda is the um, reopening of schools. So um, do is there a discussion who has questions? Let's go ahead and process this so we can move along. Ms. Scott, this is Ms. Jones. Yes, Ms. Jones. This is just a procedural thing. Ms. Hen is the vice chair. If she was planning on bringing this. She could have discussed this with you. This again goes to show how disrespectful they are of the current chair, and this needs to be noted. It was a simple email, a phone call. Ms. Hen could have done as the vice chair that they were planning on adding instead of blindsiding you every time. It was a discussion. It could have been added, and it's really truly appalling that this kind of behavior continues. Point of order, Madam Chair. Thank you for that, Ms. Jones. Um, and now it looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. Go ahead, Ms. Causey. Madam Chair, I believe Ms. Hen's point of order supersedes okay. my question. There is a point of order. Yes, what is the point of order? Madam Chair, since Ms. Jones chose to address me directly, I was not aware that this was being um, brought forward tonight. However, Excuse me, Ms. Well, Ms. Hen, um, uh, the point is not well taken. A point of order is for the ordering of the meeting and the running of the meeting, not I'm for making statements and grandstanding. We need to get through this. 
speaking. If we are going I to discuss speak. this, you let's discuss interrupt it. Ms. Jones. The point is not well taken. I was addressing. We need to go in the order. Ms. Causey, if you have a question, we need to move forward with that. The point of order is not. Point of order, point of order, Ms. Scott. Yes. Um, I know what you're um, uh, referencing in Robert's Rules of Orders. It says a point of order must be made uh, to address um, a discrepancy in the norms of the board. I don't. I, I do agree with you that you cannot make a, board of, a point of order just to address or speak on a comment. So I don't think board members should be making point of orders on that. Thank you for that, Ms. Mahoon. Mr. Mahoon. So the point is not well taken. Ms. Clausey, if you have a question, please ask it. <coughs> Okay, moving on. If you don't have a question, Mr. No, Coons, I'm sorry. Did you Excuse me, oh. Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I have. I'm experiencing a technical difficulty. If Ms. Gover can please check with uh, staff why there is a message on my screen. <clears throat> it's just making it difficult to get to my notes. Okay. okay. Uh, number one, the question is: um, Is is there a agreement? A memo of a memorandum of understanding with TABCO. Okay, and that's a question for staff. Uh, Dr. Yes. Williams, are you there? Dr. Williams? Yeah, sorry, Chairwoman Scott. It's my understanding there is a memorandum of understanding with TABCO. Okay, Thank next you. question. Thank you. And does it include the board's uh, directive that? Uh, teachers and supporting staff um, will report no more than one week prior to their students. It is aligned with the motion <laughs> that was made and approved by the board about just what you reference. So that statement is in there specifically. Uh, let me refer to the memorandum of understanding. OK, thank you. If there's another board member that has a question while you look that up, I'll yield my time. OK, next, Ms. Mack, you have a question. I have three quick questions. Um, it's my understanding that some students have been using their personal devices while learning virtually, and if those students and those students turned in their BCPS provided devices. If their personal devices are unable to connect to secure Wi-Fi when they're in school, will there be extra devices available in each school for students who have previously turned in their devices um, and who have used their personal devices at home? So that's my first question. Yes, ma'am, there will be. OK, for any student who needs one. Um, my second question references an email that we all got from a teacher that outlined many, many concerns around payroll. Um, I had asked you, Ms. Scott, Dr. Williams, and Ms. Hen to please provide some answers to that. I am very concerned, especially when it's said that um, some of the problems that have been caused are keeping people from paying their bills. Um, and I know that we're expecting an answer on Friday, but I just got another email from another teacher who said because of the issues that we're having, she has not been able to get her husband on her insurance, medical or dental, and therefore anything that has come up since January 1st, they have paid for out of pocket. And I need to know when we're going to have timely resolutions to these problems. Ms. Mack, we handle those situations case by case. We've been working hand in hand uh, with our UPAD members, uh, which are our presidents of, of, of the respective negotiation unions. When they bring the, these items to our attention or when individuals call in, uh, we make sure that we address it immediately. I just received the email that you're referencing uh, today and staff is working right now on providing those responses to those questions. So uh, if there's specific uh, names that even you receive as a board member, uh, you can forward that to Dr. Williams' office and we prioritize that. Sorry. 
can you say that last part again, please? Yes, even even if there's names that board members receive uh, and if they're forwarded to the office of the superintendent, we prioritize any name, any reference that we get uh, of individuals that are experiencing difficulty and try to address that immediately because we understand the significance of what they're dealing with. I hope I hope you could hear me a little better. No, I do hear you. And my comment to that is it's my understanding that hundreds of teachers have been impacted by these issues. And it makes me wonder if the W-2 that we'll be issuing are even going to be correct and if people will end up having to file amended tax returns. Well, we're we're taking it case by case. Like I said, we uh, I cannot quantify right now uh, the exact number of individuals. I can see if Mr. Saris can try to provide uh, a deeper uh, context to your question. Um, so, Mr. Saris, if you're able to jump on and try to field uh, the question, it would be appreciated. Well, yes, uh, we are completely aware of all the issues uh, referenced in Ms. Mack's email, and we address them every day, uh, as Dr. Scriven said, on an individual basis, and uh, we've been doing so since the attack on November 24th, which obviously seriously impaired uh, all of our human resources, payroll, benefit capabilities. So we we solve a lot of these problems every day, case by case, and we will provide uh, the answers uh, to your questions, many of which are, they seem to be individual questions that have been transmitted through Ms. Ma to Ms. Mack. Um, and so we'll, we're working on these every day. We're working on W-2s every day. We plan to issue them as stated um, with a high degree of accuracy. OK, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, looks like there's a comment from Ms. Hen. No, no comment. No comment? OK. OK, it looks like there's a question from uh, Ms. Rowe. Yes, so the CDC issued new guidelines and I'm concerned about um, some of the indications of community spread because their metrics are different than ours and they have us in the highest um, risk category for high transmission and that creates a situation where they're recommending that middle and high schools be in virtual only instruction unless they can strictly implement all mitigation strategies and have few cases. Um, schools that are already open for in-person instruction can remain open, but only if they strictly implement mitigation strategies and have few cases. And additionally, that sports and extracurricular activities are virtual only. And I wanted to know, given this new guidance, are we going to be updating our metrics to match the CDC? And how is that going to um, impact the current reopening plans that we have? So Ms. Rowe, I'll start and I'll ask Dr. Zarchin. This is Dr. Williams. Um, uh, we too have been reviewing those new guidelines and as you reference their specific language about middle and high school and extracurricular activities. Um, right now we are still collaborating with our local health department as well as the Maryland Health Department. I have a meeting this Friday uh, to glean any additional information um, about the impact. Um, Dr. Zarchin, anything you want to add to this question that Ms. Rowe just raised? Yes, so first of all, the, the mitigation protocols and practices that are recommended for a return uh, to set for secondary schools, we have in place uh, for that return. Uh, so that's good news. There's some information about testing uh, that we're trying to get, uh, get ahead of um, and working with the state. Uh, your comment about athletics is accurate. Based on the new CDC 
guidelines uh, currently based on the seven day cumulative um, count. We are at 124, which puts us uh, which puts us in a high transmission level, which is their red level. Um, and with that, it says that sports and extra extracurricular activities are virtual only. So that number, the fortunately has improved over the past few weeks. Just looking back a week, that number was 149 and the previous week was 198. So we're trending in the right direction. However, based on the new guidelines, uh, extracurricular activities should be virtual only. When we get to the substantial transmission level, which is the orange, um, then sports and extracurricular activities can be held outdoors with physical distancing of six feet or more. So this is from the new guidance that came out Friday. Um, I don't know if you have any more questions about that, but we're trying to learn more about the testing uh, that they're calling for now. It's the nucleic acid amplification test or NATS. So that's, that is a change. We don't know how significant that will be uh, with, from the data that we've been using. Okay, so basically we're working on updating our metrics to match the CDC. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, what we want to be mindful of is you know, that dashboard that we created, folks have been leaning on that to get a sense of where we're going. The changes that we make, we want to make sure that folks understand why the changes are being made. This just came out Friday um, and what the changes mean. Uh, so that that is work that we are are doing right now. So the, the dashboard is likely to change to reflect the new CDC guidelines. In their guidelines, they stress that the approach is a classroom first approach where in-person instruction is prioritized over extracurricular activities. Um, so schools can be open for instruction under these guidelines as long as the mitigation protocols are followed. Athletics, extracurricular activities, they do not want to get in the way and lead to spread that ultimately impacts students' ability to learn in the classroom. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right, so as we have a lot to get to tonight, um, we are moving on. So the next item on the agenda is the presentation on the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Saris. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Dr. Williams was going to um, respond to the first question that I asked. And I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we are moving on now to the next agenda item, the proposed budget. Everyone is, has spoken and has asked, and we are now moving on. Perhaps he can send you an email in Excuse response me, to your Chair, question, this, this, but we are now moving on. I, I thought that everybody raised their question and that we had moved on from that. Madam Chair, I um, asked my question and then I yielded time so that Dr. Williams could have staff review the memorandum of understanding in order to answer my question. Okay, so when it, so you can, Madam yes, Scott. go ahead, Dr. Williams. Yes, so uh, thank you, staff. Um, the, that language is included on page 14 of the MOU. Okay, so now thank we're going to move on to the presentation of the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. Um, and for that, as I've previously said, which we are waiting to hear from Dr. Scriven and Mr. Saris. Thank you. Ma Madam Chair, I, I, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. No, we're moving on. This is now. This is this is getting ridiculous. No, we I'm are sorry, trying Madam Chair. to I, run I an call. orderly meeting. I'm, I'm answer your question, to... and now we're trying to move on so that because we have our our budget that we need to get to that we need to review. Um, this is derailing the meeting and coming in um, and and asking and 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 saying things out of order. It's it's not going to be. Um, something that I feel should be our norm, nor should it be tolerated. So, um, Dr. Williams, are you and staff ready to present your your um, presentation? 
Excuse me, Madam Dr. Chair, Lynch, I'm going to appeal your ruling to the full board in order to process my Excuse questions. Excuse me, Ms. Causey, this is, you are out of order. You are out of order, Ms. Causey. We are moving on now to the point of presentation. Order, it, is not order, it is not out of order to appeal the ruling of the chair to the full board. She did not appeal the ruling of the chair, and you yes, are as well so. as out of order. I'm raising a point this is of becoming, order. I can't be out of order um, raising ridiculous. a point of order. This is becoming ridiculous. Ms. Causey, you asked your question. You had an answer to your question. We are trying to run an orderly meeting. We have staff. We have um, everyone know that, um, uh, you know, uh, everyone is here wanting to see the presentation. You know, yes, she has the right to appeal my ruling, but I don't know what my I don't know what she's appealing because I've not heard any appealing to any ruling. I'm trying to move on with the agenda. And Madam Chair, I would right really, Madam Chair, I read, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I'd be happy to tell you <clears throat> what I'm appealing. What are you appealing? Uh, I'm appealing that you are not allowing me to process my additional questions, which I did have time remaining on that agenda item to do so. Okay, so you would still like to continue processing your additional questions on um, the uh, opening of schools. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you still have additional questions. All right, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. I'll just ask them all at once and staff can take the time uh, it takes. Um, <clears throat> in the new CDC guidelines, they recommend that school districts have as an option teleworking or uh, remote instruction. So I'm wondering if the MOU, if that's <clears throat> already included in the reopening plan, or is that something that can be updated into the MOU based on the CDC guidance? That's number one. Number two, it was asked at the last meeting uh, what evaluation has been done to provide teachers and staff assistance with their school age children, uh, commonly referred to as cohort D, where other school districts are providing additional days of in-person instruction for teachers uh, and staff's children. And uh, the other issue was the athletics eligibility and having one parent or guardian uh, with student athletes, which is consistent with the county executive guidelines. Those are my questions. Thank you. OK. So Dr. Williams. Sure. So Madam uh, Chairperson Scott, I just like to uh, reference a couple of points. Um, we we do have an MOU. Um, we are looking at our cohorts of A and B, those students and families who choose to come in. We did not look at a cohort D of staff with children to come in multiple days. Um, we are looking at how many staff we have to figure out the cohorts um, in addition to those staff members that receive um, the approved accommodations. So telework was for a staff member who could do that based on uh, the configuration of an office. Um, we did allow that uh, during this, uh, the beginning of the school year. Uh, I did ask staff to continue to look at what other means we can provide in terms of child care. Um, staff members are still working with that and looking at our vendors and partners. Um, the athletic eligibility, as you all know, we received that late Friday. We made that public about um, the motion that the board made um, which the state and MPSSAA gave us a ruling. We're waiting for the official letter um, about waiving the academic eligibility. Um, we were referred to Comar, which speaks to specific language around a standard. Um, it speaks to each local school system shall establish standards of participation, which are sure that students involved in interscholastic athletics are making satisfactory progress towards graduation. Every school system has defined what that is. Um, and finally, in terms of sports, the return to play um, really looked at the configuration and not having 
um, the staff based on the motion of one week in advance. Um, we have to we had to make a decision to really cut down the number of, of spectators. So we said no spectators because we wouldn't have the staff to um, proctor or monitor support these athletic events. Um, those not knowing that these questions were coming up tonight, those are the best responses I can provide at this time. Um, we'll be happy to follow up uh, again as we meet next week. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And now the next item on the agenda is the presentation on the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget, operating budget rather. And for that, I call on Dr. Skirvin and Mr. Saris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, Mr. Saris uh, has a uh, high level presentation uh, that he is going to share with the board. Uh, I believe that was shared with the board uh, a little over a week ago. Uh, for your reference, I would be remiss if I did not one, thank the board for their patience, uh, for the motion uh, that was made for us to try to put together a budget book which more closely resembled uh, the budget book that the board is accustomed to and was supplied to the board last year. Um, I want to thank the team uh, for uh, the countless hours. And when I say the team, not just the fiscal team, but the BCPS team, because this was definitely a cross-functional office um, accomplishment uh, for what you guys received uh the friday uh before last so with that said mr saris i'm going to yield the floor to you uh to go over the powerpoint uh then we will field uh any additional questions we did receive some questions late uh yesterday uh that we are still working on responding but uh based on the questions that you uh, have uh, we may be able to give some high level answers what we are not able to answer uh, we will uh, research and, and get uh, back to you in um, a timely manner. So, Mr. Harris, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thanks, Dr. Scriven, and uh, good evening to members of the board, Dr. Williams. Uh, I do want to briefly uh, recall that at our first work session, uh, we, uh, we reviewed the Division of Business Services and the all schools budgets and uh, tonight we are going to uh, review the offices uh, that report to the superintendent uh, next slide please the first of which is uh, curriculum and instruction next slide please uh, constri uh, curriculum and construction consists of the department of academics which contains all of our core content areas math, English, language, arts, science, social studies, and others. Uh, the Department of Special Education, which provides services to students from birth to age 21 and includes uh, our largest ongoing grant uh, in the form of the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education uh, grant. The uh, Office of Curriculum Operations, which manages athletics, and grading and reporting. Next slide, please. The Department of Educational Options, which uh, manages our magnet programs, extended day, extended year programs, e-learning, home and hospital, and a variety of alternative programs. Uh, the Department of Academic Services, which has our second largest ongoing grant, Title I, as well as uh, advanced academics, college career readiness, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Here is a summary of the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Um, and you'll note that the largest uh, section of this pie, which is purple, um, consists primarily of non-public placement costs. Um, the uh, apart from salaries and wages, the next largest segment, uh, the red 
uh, slice is our contracted services, which includes related services uh, in order to meet a lot of the needs of special education students, parent reimbursements, also related to the needs of special education students, uh, athletics, both transportation and referees, uh, and library subscriptions, and uh, supplies and materials is the next largest section in green, which includes textbooks, library books, uh, science kits, and all sorts of uh, centrally provided supplies and materials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we'd like to highlight some of the efficiencies and realignments that the division has achieved that uh, contribute to this year's budget. Um, due to the decreased costs of software and digital resources, the division has been able to absorb cost increases to musical instrument repairs, which have been larger than usual this year, uh, partly because of COVID and the safety response. Uh, athletic transportation for Western School of Technology and uh, mathematics consumables uh, related to the Bridges program in grades K to two. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and furthermore, by redirecting resources and achieving efficiencies, uh, the division has been able to provide uh, different transportation programs uh, in, for BioBlitz, the BizTown, uh, Personal Finance Theory Fair, uh, Junior Achievement, uh, as well as athletic trainers, which we've had in place for a couple of years, uh, but have never received any additional funding from county government uh, to maintain this program at all our high schools, as well as some partial funding for textbook, math textbooks, um, uh, geometry and algebra, as well as the mock trial program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and let's move uh, on to the other offices. Uh, one more slide, please, Mr. Corns. Yes, the other uh, offices of the superintendent that we'll be discussing tonight, Office of Law, which provides legal advice to the administration, uh, represents the administration and schools in all uh, matters of special education and represents the board before the State Board of Education. Uh, organizational effectiveness, which provides professional learning, promotes equity and access, develops leader skill, leadership skills, and uh, maintains professional certifications. Next slide, please. The uh, chief of staff supports the day-to-day -day operations of the superintendent's office, uh, manages communications, uh, community engagement, uh, and employee and student hearings. Human Resources uh, recruits and retains a highly qualified, effective, and diverse teacher workforce, provides uh, position classification, uh, position documents, position certification, professional certifications, manages workers' compensation, unemployment, and all employee benefits. Next slide, please. Research accountability and assessment provides for the accurate, timely uh, access to data, uh, the implementation and reporting of state assessments, ensures that uh, the use of data is accurate and responsible, and provides expert consultation to support program evaluation. And the Division of Climate, School Climate and Safety uh, ensures that students experience high levels of a social, emotional, and cognitive growth, uh, provides a comprehensive continuum of both counseling, uh, academic counseling, and psychological counseling, uh, serves as a liaison between the home, the school, and the community, uh, manages health and wellness for uh, staff and students, and provides a safe, secure, and orderly learning environment. Uh, next slide, please. So all of those uh, offices, uh, other than curriculum and instruction, 
are uh, summarized uh, with this expense chart. Uh, the largest purple sector, uh, other charges, includes all the fringe, benef fringe benefits for the entire organization, uh, medical, health, dental, vision, pension, uh, workers' compensation, uh, and other insurance. Um, Contract services, uh, which is the next uh, largest non salary section, includes uh, continuing education course content, um, our school messenger service, uh, the equipment for the copy and print office, um, the data warehouse software and technical consulting, uh, counseling software, nursing software, uh, security services and student identification software. Uh, next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Uh, now we'll summarize uh, the efficiencies and realignments that have been achieved this year. Um, organizational effectiveness has collaborated with human resources uh, on a revised teacher recruitment, onboarding and retention plan. They've um, provided virtual options for orientation, workshops, uh, and prof continuing professional development courses, and provided training with on all the tools, uh, such as Teams, Google Meet, SharePoint, uh, that have helped us uh, maintain this virtual learning and working environment. The Chief of Staff uh, has now uh, handled and absorbed the communications uh, management role, which uh, is significant. Uh, next slide, please. Human resources has aligned the structure of the Office of Staffing uh, to align with BCPS zones to providing a more efficient service model. They manage the peer assistance and review program that we use to uh, train and support all of our new teachers as they enter the profession, years one to three. Uh, they've restructured the recruitment plan to a virtual platform, including virtual job fairs, vir virtual screening interviews, and the like. Uh, they've enhanced our partnerships with local and national historically black colleges and universities. And uh, this year, a special task in particular was implementing the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which uh, we're continuing to implement through March of this year. Uh, next slide, please. Research accountability and assessment has reorganized its, uh, its four offices to align the research, the nature of the research with the use of the data. They've created the public COVID-19 dashboard to provide us with updates on infection rates and the school opening score. They've coordinated the development of the superintendent's system improvement team, uh, developed a project plan to support uh, the use of, uh, expand the development of surveys, questionnaires, and program evaluations, coordinated access across uh, all the divisions and establish 56 different office progress plans that they monitor and uh, created new reports to enhance database decision making. Next slide, please. Uh, Division of School Climate and Safety has uh, supported the transition to virtual instruction by engaging students in a safe and positive climate. Uh, around discipline, attendance, and mental health. Uh, they provided consultation and coaching for staff to support the system's pandemic response and collaborated with the Baltimore County Health Department for vaccine administration, outbreak management, and response and contract contact tracing. And uh, with that, uh, we have the rest of our agenda to answer your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Mr. Saris. So um, the next item on the agenda is, the, is as the superintendent's proposed budget, operating budget 
um, is discussion of the board. And as a reminder, I would just let everyone know that the student member of the board is not eligible to vote on the budget. Therefore, six votes are required to carry a motion. So uh, board members, I'm going to go around the dais and so that we make sure everyone has ample time to ask questions and that we can um, hear from everyone. And we will start first with Ms. Rowe. Madam Chair, before we go to Ms. Rowe, can I make the motion to suspend the rules to lift the time limits for this agenda item? <laughs> Second, Ms. Causey. And this was Ms. Penn. Could you please put that in the chat again? As I said, I've asked for motions um, to be emailed in advance as as um, we can so that I can properly state them. Um, but the person making the motion is Ms. Hen, and it sounds like it was seconded by Ms. Causey, but um, I'm not sure what that motion is. So if you could please put that in the chat so I can properly restate it, greatly appreciate it. Ms. Scott, um, point of inquiry. Since this is a procedural uh, motion that Ms. Hen's making, is that can the student member vote on this? Oh yes, Doc. Uh, excuse me, um, Mr. Mercedes, could you please weigh in on that? Yes, the student member could vote on this particular procedural question, which doesn't go directly to the substance of the budget. Correct. Okay. So it would be seven. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, thank you for Ms. Hen for putting it in the chat so that I can properly restate it and um, it becomes a property of the assembly. I move to suspend the rules to lift the time limit for board member questions. So it was stated, um, moved by Ms. Rowe, seconded by Ms. Causey. It was moved by Ms. Sorry, Hen. It was, I did not. Oh, okay, apologies. It was moved by Ms. Hen seconded by Ms. Causey. Yes, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I did second it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Yep, just want to make sure that we have everything accurate. OK, um, and it's to suspend the rules for the time, which currently is at two minutes. All right. Um, is there any debate on this? Are, are there any questions, um, discussion by board members? Uh, Ma Madam Chair, Eric Brusades here. Uh, yes. this, this motion is not debatable. Okay, this motion is not debatable. Okay, so we need to bring it directly to vote. Is that correct? Yes, and it requires a two thirds majority. Okay, so two thirds out of 12 is seven? Eight. Eight, I apologize, excuse me, eight. Okay, so we will bring it to vote. Um, Ms. Gover, if you could take the roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? No. Ms. Tan? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor seven, opposed is four, and we have one absent. Okay, so there are seven in favor and four opposed. So uh, the motion requires two thirds. So, uh, so if I'm correct, the motion fails. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, was, I'm sorry, excuse me. I wanted to confirm with the secretary. So the motion fails, okay. All right, thank you. Um, who is speaking, please? Yes, this is Ms. Hen. I'd like to. Yes, Ms. Hen. I'd like to move to amend the rules to change the time limit from two minutes to five minutes for board member questions, and I'll put that in the chat. Second, Mac. Point of. Okay, so uh, this sounds like if I could. Um, this sounds like this is the same motion, and um, as I've understand Robert's rules. That's a zombie motion. That's the same motion within the same meeting within the same assembly. So um, you can't do the same motion twice. Um, Eric, uh, please confirm that or, or let me know if that's incorrect. If this would be considered a reconsideration, that would be correct. And it does appear to be 
fairly similar. Uh, the suspension of the two minute rule versus expanding it to five minutes. OK, OK, yes. Yeah. So as I understand it, you can't do the same motion twice, which is what that is. So um, not in the same meeting. So considering that it failed, then we need to move on. And so I would just ask again, uh, we can go around the dais and ask board members to um, uh, give their <coughs> questions um, again. Therefore, it's you know six votes are required to carry a motion um, as a student member cannot vote. So we'll start it around the dais and Ms. Gover, if you could start um, with Ms. Rowe first. Thank you. Excuse me, Madam Chair. This is Ms. Causey, and I'm going to appeal the ruling of the chair to the full board. I believe that Ms. Hen is making a substantial difference rather than uh, board member comments being unlimited, which was her first motion. She is now stating that they would be for five minutes. I believe that's a substantial difference, and I would um, <clears throat> appeal to the board to take a vote on whether her motion is in order. OK, and Eric, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Mercedes, if you could advise, because I'm going with the advisement of our legal counsel who said that it is, it would appear that it is the same motion. So um, Mr. Mercedes, um, again, if you could give advice on that because as I understand it we cannot do the same motion twice which is what that is that is correct madam okay. chair but I think that uh, the ruling of the chair could be uh, appealed okay so Ms. Calsey ruled um, to or excuse me not ruled. <laughs> she made a request to appeal the um, decision of the chair um, does it require a second? Yes. Is second there a second row. to appeal the decision of the chair? Second row. OK, so um, basically the the chair's decision to um, has been appealed and basically the motion is it, what we're voting on now is whether or not you want to suspend the time limit to amend the rules from two minutes to five minutes for board members for questions. So. Um, if Madam you chair, are uh, so begging your patience, that's not what we're voting on. We're voting well, on, we're voting on the, the appealing. Correct. Yeah, what we're voting on is to appeal the chair's decision. Right. We're that's not we're actually voting on. voting on the decision to suspend the rule. That is correct. But I was giving information the chair's decision was based on amending the rules for the time limit. But what we are voting on now is to appeal the chair's decision, which is what Ms. Causey um, moved on and what Ms. Rowe seconded. So, um, you know, all as many who are in favor of appealing the chair's decision, you say yes. Those who are opposed to appealing the chair's decision, um, say no when your name is called. So Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Seven in favor, four opposed, one absent. And if I understand, does it take two thirds to pass? Madam Chair, just a majority for appealing the chair. Okay. So seven in favor. So um, the decision to appeal the chair's decision is upheld because it was seven. So it's majority. OK, so then um, we would then vote on the motion. Is that Madam correct, Chair. Mr. Bruce That is I'm correct. Sorry. OK. Madam would you is like to Yeah, I, okay, I just have yes, a, go ahead, sir. I just have a quick question for um, uh, the parliamentarian. I was just reading uh, on page nine of the nearly re revised uh, Roberts Rules of Order, and it, it's uh, stated the um, three instances where uh, an appeal 
um, shall be made of the chair's decision. Um, I, I just um, I thought what Miss um, Scott did was just um, adhere to your advisement. It was didn't relate to uh, uh, any uh, indecorum or transgression with rules of speaking or priority of business or is made when an undebatable question is immediately pending or involved in the appeal. I just thought she was just following your directions. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Yes. But the chair ultimately makes the decision. OK, um, if you could expand on that, um, uh, Mr. Proceedings, because I, I was basically following your directions um, based on everything, but. Yeah, and I, sorry, and, and just for my clarification, I, I thought it an appeal had to fall into uh, those three instances that I just uh, mentioned. Um, just for your um, citation, it's on page nine of the newly advised proper rules of order. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Mr. Holmes. So I would like to move on and process the motion. And as I understand it, Ms. Hen, you put it in the chat and the motion. Um, would you like me to reread it, Madam Chair? Uh, well, I can read it because I see what you put into the chat. Um, you said, I move to amend the rules to amend the time limit from two minutes to five minutes for board member questions. So it was moved by you, seconded by Ms. Causey, I believe. So um, I'd like to go ahead and process this motion so that we can move forward. Um, Ms. Gover, if you could take the roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hens? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Seven in favor, four opposed, one absent. Okay, so seven in favor, so the motion carries. So um, again, so now it's five minutes per board member. Mr. Bersades, um, if you could adjust the time so that we can, um, instead of having a two minutes per board member, five minutes per board member. And if we could go around the dais and starting with Ms. Rell, Ms. Go, if we could um, begin that with any questions or Discussion. Me, Thank this you. Is Mr. Offerman. Yes, Mr. Offerman. Did, did that vote require majority or 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 uh, or did it require uh, two 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 thirds? I believe it required majority, but um, Mr. Bersadis, if you could chime in. A majority for that one. Thank you. Ms. Scott, may I ask a clarifying question, please? Yes, if you could state your name, who's speaking, please. I'm sorry, Lisa Mack. Um, do you want board members as you go around the dais to use their entire five minutes or um, is that? The preference would be for board members as we go around the dais to use their five minutes individually, yes. And does that include questions and motions? Que not questions or responses from staff, but questions and motions from board members, yes. <clears throat> Uh, can you just repeat that last comment, please? Uh, what I would believe would be most efficient in a running our meeting would be that any questions or motions from board members would be included in that five minutes as we go around the dais to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions, make motions, or um, uh, give a response. So, okay, just use the five minutes up. Okay, thank you. No, yep. thank you for your question. All right, Ms. Gover, are we ready to begin? Okay, yes. All right, we can start first with Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so on page 248 and 249 in Appendix E for curriculum and instruction, there are numerous cuts to magnet office funding, instructional salaries and wages, instructional textbooks and supplies, other instructional costs and student transportation services. 
Um, would you explain why these cuts are being made? Dr. Williams or uh, staff? Mr. Sarris, you may be on mute, sir. Uh, hi, Ms. Rowe. This is Mr. Tam. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, um, most of those um, adjustments were a combination of uh, the system-wide reduction that uh, was allocated to all the offices across the system to um, help deliver the cost of living adjustment in FY21. And that's reflected in this budget book, uh, along with uh, adjustments that the offices have the freedom to make when they put their budget together. Did we see reduced enrollment in magnet programs? Um, no. I do not have the answer to that. What I year? Answer, you I to? Oh, go ahead, Mary. I was going to say, no, Ms. Rowe, we have not had a reduction in um, applications or enrollment. Uh, it continues to be a very uh, in-demand uh, opportunity. Okay, so if we have not seen a reduction in magnet program enrollment, why are we reducing, um, why are we cutting the budget for magnet programs based on lowered student enrollment when that is not the area where the enrollment is being lowered? Um, well, that uh, those reductions are not the in-school reduction, so that doesn't at all impact the per pupil that gets allocated to the schools. It's some of the central office support dollars. Um, and again, as I noted, every office across the system needed um, to take reductions in things like supplies and travel uh, and other areas to help uh, deliver the COLA for the system for our employees. How is this going to impact magnet students? Well, um, Dr. Boswell, yeah. McComas, maybe you could. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to invite uh, Dr. Wistead, who is actively overseeing our magnet program, to shed some uh, details on that. Uh, Melissa, it's difficult Hello. to hear you. Can you hear me? Is this? Yes, now we can. Thank you. OK, um, sure. So uh, there is not a reduction um, that's happening to the schools um, or their ability to accept students. All of that information has been um, already communicated to schools and families as far as the application process. So um, I, I'm unclear why you believe there is a reduction happening at for magnet schools only. Well, right, well I um, it's not magnet schools only that I'm looking at the reduction. It's because I'm seeing cuts to magnet office funding and for instructional textbooks and supplies and transportation services. And I want to know what the impact of those funding cuts are going to be on the student. In other words, are we reducing bus routes for magnet students? Are there going to be um, shrinking of programs? Is there going to be um, fewer students capable of being enrolled in magnet programs? I want to know what the impact of those decisions are on the magnet program. So Ms. Um, Ms. Bro, I can add to that. So the per pupil funds uh, for the school remain the same. This really reduces our funding available to our other uh, magnet special projects is really where we would feel the reduction. Like what? What other magnet special projects? What do you mean by that? So it could be something that central office may offer to different magnet schools, like opportunities to attend conferences. As Mr. Tantliff was saying, that was reduced for everyone across the board. Um, it could be those types of professional learning 
opportunities where we would have additional funds as an example. So, so, so we're talking about enrichment programs that augment the current magnet programs. It wouldn't be for students directly. It would be um, like professional learning, perhaps for teachers or opportunities for staff again to attend conferences, which is being cut overall. Okay. You know, you know it could be things like um, if uh, additional books were needed, just like any other program, if additional equipment would be needed, just like any other program, you know, because there's cuts overall to all the programs, that's also included in the magnet programs. Okay, so where student transportation services is concerned, we're not limiting the current offering of transportation from a student's house to the school to where they can attend a magnet program. Correct, but it could be something like um, if they were taking uh, field trips or things like that, there could be cuts in transportation for those kinds of opportunities. Okay. All right, thank you. I reserve the remainder of my time until everyone else has had their questions answered. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. I thought we were doing, everyone was doing their five minutes during their time period, and then we were moving on to the next person. Um, I don't believe we were doing the remaining balance of the time to then come back. Um, I believe that's what Ms. Um, uh, uh, what Ms. Mack had asked, that we were doing the five minutes. I know that's minutes. what she asked, but I don't know that we actually have a rule that says that. According to Robert's rules, everyone gets two opportunities to speak. Yes. In addition and to whatever time limit. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying that I may make use of my second opportunity, depending on what other board members ask for their questions. And okay. otherwise, but me it, going first, I'm put at a disadvantage. I get two opportunities, well, Robert's rules says so. Correct. Yes. Um, and Robert Schultz yes. is, you know, what we go by. But however, in the interest of time and being efficient, we are suggesting that everyone use their five minutes and ask their questions and make any motions so that we can make sure that everybody um, has opportunity for ample time. So and everybody has opportunity to speak. So um, we were not doing reserving the balance of the time, but um, that would be out of order, and I would have to appeal that to that the is, full board. If that okay, is well, we can appeal it to the full board, but you know, at this point, we okay. do need to move on. So, I Ms. Mack, the ruling you, of the chair, excuse me, not to right allow now, me to have a I haven't made, time. I haven't made a ruling. I have not made a ruling. Yep. I just said that we, it was something that we discussed that we were doing going forward. But you know, it was a question that Ms. Mack had raised. And that would be the preference, but I, I have not made a ruling. I just raised it to your team. <coughs> so we can move on now. Ms. Causey, you're next. Ms. Causey, are you there? Good evening. I am here. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to read policy 3000. The Board of Education of Baltimore County recognizes that the effective and efficient use of its resources is essential to ensure that Baltimore County Public Schools remains a model of public sector fiscal management. To serve that end, the board encourages fiscal planning, guides the expenditure of funds so as to meet the goals of the system, requires maximum effectiveness and efficiency in all accounting, budgeting, purchasing, and other fiscal processes and procedures, and requires accountability over the use of all funds. The other thing is policy 3123, financial reporting. The Board of Education of Baltimore County recognizes its responsibility for management of all funds appropriated for the education of students enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools. The board believes that sound fiscal management also requires receiving periodic financial information on the status of all financial transactions, all accounts, and all funds appropriated for the education of students enrolled in BCPS. The superintendent shall prepare and submit to the board and to appropriate Baltimore County officials monthly and annual financial reports regarding the status of appropriated funds. In preparing monthly and annual financial statements, the superintendent shall adhere to all federal, state, and local laws and regulations, grant guidelines, and principles and pronouncements of the Government of County Standing Boards. Um, my first question is, uh, what is the process by which um, the superintendent and the school system provide uh, financial reports to the board and also to Baltimore County officials. 
This is Mr. Saris. The primary means by which uh, we provide that information is uh, through the board's agenda uh, in the information section beginning in September of the year and every month thereafter. We provide a monthly financial report to the board. Baltimore County government has uh, indicated that that report has so far met their needs and uh, if we hear otherwise, we would uh, respond to that uh, from the county. Thank you, Mr. Saris. You're welcome. Next policy 3111 um, states a number of things. Um, the board recognizes its responsibility for preparation of an annual budget that supports the operating and capital needs of the school system and aligns with the board's vision, mission, and goals. The development and adoption of the operating and capital budgets will be in accordance with state law and the Code of Maryland regulations. The superintendent shall prepare an annual operating and capital budget and submit the budgets to the board in accordance with state law, state regulation board policies. In planning for the funds to be included in the budget request, the superintendent shall identify the budget initiatives by considering input from the community, area education advisory council, staff, and other stakeholder groups. Um, second question is, how um, has the superintendent and the school system identified the budget initiatives um, and in what manner is that recorded document documented and provided to the board? Well, primarily through this budget document and in a more concise uh, summary, uh, if we look to uh, the section of the document um, each year, the uh, in this case on page 19 of the current document, uh, the executive uh, summary by focus area is the primary. Uh, it's the most concise summary of the programs that are proposed by the superintendent. Mr. Brusades, how much time do I have left, please? Two and a half minutes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Mr. Saris, as a follow up, how would the board know that the budget includes um, requests by the Area Education Advisory Councils, our uh, Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council, and our Special Education Citizen Advisory Council, among other community stakeholder groups? Well, those, I believe those groups report directly to the board. So, my understanding is that you would receive that information from them. Either at a public meeting or by whatever other means the board and their committees communicate. So Mr. Saris, in policy 3111, it says the superintendent shall identify the budget initiatives by considering input from the community area education advisory council staff and other stack stakeholder groups. So yes, how would my staff attends those meetings and and we convey those notes uh, to the superintendent, at least from the advisory committees. Um, we do not meet with, you know, the special ed citizens advisory groups or the, uh, you know, gifted and talented groups or or others. But we do brief the superintendent on the advice uh, the area advisory committee discussions. I can add, Mr. Saris, that for the GTCAC and the CAC uh, CAC group. Uh, that my staff attends those and their um, budget recommendations and input are rolled up in through our process. Thank you, Dr. McComas. So how would the board understand if they if their requests are in the budget? Well, I you, can you speak. Can Go ahead, yeah, Mr. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Boswell-McCombs. 
Yeah, yes, so good evening. So um, I'll speak for uh, my teams, Ms. Causey. Um, our team takes back those recommendations. We can take CCAC, for example, and then we um, typically work to try to incorporate what we um, see as feasible uh, within a, a particular budget cycle. Um, for example, I know uh, year upon year, uh, CCAC has um, you know, advocated to acquire positions to create elementary IEP uh, facilitator positions. Um, and as we work through the process, typically uh, there's requests that we put in and then over time they of course um, become trimmed down as we work through the process because we recognize that there's, you know, uh, a whole budget uh, that needs to be put together. Um, and so that's typically how this process works. And so that's where you would be able to see uh, which pieces of those recommendations are folded into any particular uh, budget cycle. And from uh, the non-instructional side of the house, the uh, what we see uh, each year is that uh, at the advisory committee level, uh, despite the fact that it's uh, it's not the capital budget public hearing, uh, I would say that the majority of input that we get from uh, those groups is regarding facilities improvements and, and the capital budget and as you will note the the proposed capital budget uh, to both for both the state and the county includes almost every significant program uh, that that we can make uh much of which is in excess of the available resources and i think i can say that almost all of which uh, are items that are discussed by the area advisory committees thank you also policy 2310 organization charts uh, to achieve the stated mission and goals of the school system, the Board of Education of Baltimore County must maintain an organizational structure focused on performance, accountability, and meeting the school system's goal of organizational effectiveness. The superintendent shall prepare annually an organization chart and submit it to the board for approval. Uh, all organizational changes involving positions that report directly to the superintendent or positions at the executive director level and above shall be submitted to the board for its approval. Um, in what manner are those uh, changes presented to the board for approval? Mrs. Harris, I would I would say let's defer uh, to HR on that. So, Ms. Lowry, if you're okay. available. Sure. So, when there is a change at um, those levels, executive director and above, those do go before the board for approval. Um, so each time there is an appointment that is part of that and then it is um, my understanding and Mr. Tantlick if you can correct me if I'm wrong um, that there is an org chart that is part of um, this budget book for the superintendent. Yes that's on right. page 21. And, and something else that Dr. Williams has changed uh, has been to add uh, organizational charts uh, for each division um, and we'll, we're still working on the level of detail that that will ultimately be presented, but that's something uh, that is relatively recent. Thank you. I would like to make a motion to prioritize the superintendent's recommendation to add 15 minutes to the teacher's duty day to extend the school day by 15 minutes. Second, Mac. Okay, so the motion has been moved and seconded. Ms. Clausey, could you please put the motion in the chat, please? Yes. And if I could speak to my motion while I'm doing that, please? Yes. Um, so staff can confirm that uh, since at least I believe 2016, um, maybe before that, uh, the state superintendent 
um, I believe it was uh, Dr. Lowry at the time, uh, um, <clears throat> wanted Baltimore County to add 15 minutes to the school day um, for multiple reasons. One, we have the shortest school day in the state. Um, so our teachers and students are being asked to complete the college and career um, standards from the state uh, at a time deficit of every other school district. Uh, additionally, it has added uh, considerable challenges when we had um, e extended inclement weather, whether it was schools closing because of. Um, OK, excuse me, Mr. Brusetti, is that sounds the like time? the time is up. Um, so oh. until I state the motion, it cannot be debated and I have not stated the motion yet because I don't know what the motion is. So um, I, I have a point or, of inquiry or have a question. I, I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Who is speaking? Um, it's Miss Causey. Yes, Miss Causey. I have a point of inquiry. Is it about your motion? Because I, I members and the public don't know what the motion is because it has not. I've not stated it, so it's not come to the full assembly. So uh, we're not able to debate it um, or bring it. It has to do with the time. I see it. has to do with the timing of the buzzer. You're oh OK, so you have a question about um, about the buzzer. Um, I would yes. just ask just because I know we're going to have a lot of motions and it's a lot going on that we try as much as we can to stick to the um, to the question at hand and to what we're we're doing. Um, so I'd like you to put the motion in there so I can state it so that it can be debated and then so that we can um, move forward. Um, so, okay. So now I can um, restate your motion. So the motion which was brought by uh, Ms. Causey was I move to prioritize the superintendent's recommendation to add 15 minutes to the teacher's duty day and the school day. And um, this was seconded by who? Or was it seconded? I did. I thought I heard a second. Yes, by Ms. Mack. OK, so it was seconded by Ms. Mack. OK, so I've now stated it. It's the property of the assembly, so now we can debate it. Um, who has a question? Um, is there any discussion on this? Madam Chair, I'd like to finish speaking to my motion. I thought you'd already spoken to it. It seemed self-explanatory. So there. I, I thought your time was up, Ms. Causey. Um, it looks like there's some questions about the motion you made. So um, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Jose because we're now we're questioning the motion. So debate is on the, the motion that Ms. Causey made. So yes, Ms. Jose, it looks like you're next. Please go ahead. I think Ms. Pastor was before me. Oh, Ms. Pastor, was your question about the motion? It oh, was. I apologize. Yes, Ms. Oh, Pastor. I'm sorry, excuse me. It looks it like is. there is a question from um, Ms. Pastor and then Ms. Rowe on the motion and, and then Ms. Jose. Yeah, thank you for that. I apologize. Go ahead, Ms. Right. Pastor. I, and thank you, um, Ms. Jose. Um, I see that it says the recommendation of the superintendent. Um, I, I trust his vision. I just need to add that uh, we should all be very concerned uh, about our teachers and the workday of our teachers. Everything that Ms. Causey stated, yes, is, is true in terms of length of time. Um, I'm concerned about uh, instructional time and time for teachers to um, be able to work to that end. And I would caution uh, with this particular motion that 15 minutes in terms of what it costs, and I have worked out the numbers that the amount of money that it will cost for those 15 minutes uh, could certainly be used uh, so that we can start processing the compression of our salary scale from uh, 30 years down, looking at the 25 to the 20. Um, and I think that 
is really important and because once we do this particular motion, if it passes, every year that amount of money has to be encumbered to take care of that. So I would think that there's some other things to look at, but I'm interested in making sure our teachers are treated as the professionals they are, and no one should have to work 30 years to get to the top of the scale and 26 to $29 million that we will encumber every year really bites into our ability to treat our teachers long-term as the professionals that they are. So I just share uh, that as an observation because we are out of compliance with all of the systems around us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pestor. Next, we have Ms. Rowe. Yes, I would like to hear staff response on this motion. Dr. Williams, is there a staff response on this motion? So I will ask. So just to clarify, um, that recommendation to add 15 minutes was based on the board's motion to add 15 minutes. Uh, so I want to clarify um, the motion that was raised and then to staff in terms of clarifying, uh, can we give kind of an additional uh, information about the cost of what that may look like? Mr. Sayers. Yes, it's, uh, it's approximately $29. Point uh, four million dollars. Mr. Tantliff can correct me. Yes. Okay. And that's for 15 minutes. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Rowe? Um, no. Okay. Uh, Ms. Joes? Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, while I agree with the notion of this motion, um, my question, and I think Mr. Saros has answered it, what it's going to cost. I believe it was 25, but you said about $29 million. But I have heard back from a lot of teachers, and our teachers are doing a lot during this pandemic. We have to be empathetic towards that. Um, they're doing so much. I've heard from teachers not having time for self-care and, and adding this 15 minutes. Is that just for this fiscal year 22, 23, or is that moving forward for every budget we would have the 15 minutes? And as a parent, I, I do like the addition of 15 minutes. I do, I, I do, but I also have to look at the other aspect of what our teachers are doing and how uh, this would affect our, our negotiations with the bargaining units as well. So if anybody could answer that, thank you. Yes, that would be an ongoing cost and that cost would increase in alignment with any other adjustments to salaries because it's based on the uh, instructional salaries uh, that we currently have, which uh, tend to increase and thereby then increase uh, the cost of those 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, if I could add an amendment to the motion. Yes, you may. Um, I would like to amend this motion to be added to the next fiscal year budget 22-23 for consideration by the board. OK, if you could put your amendment in the chat. Um, so you're wanting to amend the main motion Yes, if we could postpone this motion for consideration for the ne next fiscal year. Okay, so you're making a, a, an amendment to, yeah, if you could put that in there because you're moving to amend this motion to basically postpone it to the next fiscal year. Is that correct? Yes, for consideration. For the so next are you adding year. language or are you striking language? I just want to be clear. Uh, I will be adding to, I guess, postpone. It sounds motion. like you're moving to postpone the motion. And I just want to yes. make sure I'm correct. So I'm moving to, I guess, I don't know, is that an amendment or would that just be a postponing to for consideration in the next fiscal year? I'm not clear. Uh, Mr. Bersanis, if you could give us clarification on that. 
the way like Miss Joe's the way Miss Joe's has it phrased it is more in the nature of a postponement. Okay, so Miss Joe's is moving to postpone this motion to the next fiscal year. Okay, is that correct, Miss Joe's? Correct. Yes. Okay. Does that require a second? Second, Offerman. There we go. Okay. All right. So then we need to process the amendment. Uh, excuse me. The postponement. Um, Ms. Jose has moved to postpone the motion to the. Um, yeah. So Ms. Jose has moved to postpone the motion for the next fiscal year, and it has been seconded by Mr. Offerman. So um, we need to take a vote on that. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote on the postponement. Madam Chair, I put in the chat that I had a comment on this amendment. This is Ms. Causey. Um, so it's not an amendment, it's a postponement. And um, I believe that it, it requires a vote. Um, Mr. Persades, is that correct? When there's a motion to postpone? Um, uh, the motion to the motion to postpone is debatable, Madam Chair. It is debatable. OK, so go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. So. Um, our, um, <clears throat> the point is well taken that our teachers already work extra. They did it before the pandemic. Uh, they did it before the cyber attack, um, but they are definitely doing it now. What this does is it is a step to pay them more for the time that they do spend. Also, there is an issue with the um, hours that are required by MSDE and staff can speak to the difficulties that there have been related to inclement weather days, whether those were um, closures at the beginning of the year for heat or whether they were through the winter time. Um, and there that has caused problems in the past, including having to uh, uh, do a memo of understanding with uh, TABCO to have teachers work an extra duty day at the end of the year because of those difficulties. Um, the other question I so I would vote no to this amendment. It's a postpone. It's it's a postponement, not an amendment. So um, thank you. I would yes. vote no to postpone this. Thank you. Thank you for that. OK, and it looks like we also have a question from uh, um, Mrs. Pastor. And, okay. and what we're discussing now is this, the motion to postpone, not the original right. motion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, I appreciate the um, the uh, postponement because $29 million, again, uh, that we can use every single year to take a look at how we can catch our teachers up is critical. I think it needs research to see what the long term impact on uh, what we give our teachers is important. And so the postponement certainly gives our staff a year to take a look at it. And I'm encouraging them to do just that. 30 years is too long. I would love to see the impact of $29 million and how it can be used to better pay our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Ms. Rowe. Yeah, so um, I'm concerned that in postponing the motion, we're not creating a situation where we're telling the school system that we want this in the next budget. We're just simply not deliberating on it now. And um, so I don't see a reason to postpone something that we can deliberate on now. And it's, it's the postponing this motion doesn't automatically put it into the next budget cycle. It just means we re-deliberate on this again in a year. And so I can't support the postponement for that reason. Thank you. OK. OK, um, so it uh, looks like we have uh, everyone has spoken and we need to bring it to a vote. The motion is to postpone as many are in favor of postponing to the next fiscal year. Uh, looks like 2022, 2022 to 2023. Um, please say yes when your name is called. As many are uh, are opposed, say no when your name is called. Um, and what this means is if adopted, we will postpone the consideration of extension of the school day until the next school year. So Ms. Gover, um, 
Could you call the roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Mack? I'm sorry, Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomza? I'm sorry. Mr. Offerman? Uh, yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is four, opposed is seven. Okay, so the motion to postpone, um, it looks like, uh, and if I'm correct, Mr. Mercedes, we needed a majority, so it looks like the motion fails. Correct. Okay. All right, so the motion fails, so we can um, go back to debating the motion. Um, Ms. Causey, you said you had a comment? Yes, but I believe other board members are, um, I would yield and let them go first. They've not yet spoken to the motion. Okay, I didn't have anyone else who said they had a question to speak to the motion. Um, um, Ms. Scott, excuse I'm me, Ms. Scott, I, I had um, several people that I had a comment in the chat. You have a comment? Okay. Okay, Ms. Mack, you have a comment, and then I'm going back up here. It looks like Ms. Mack and then Mr. Kuhn. And yes, I, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. Excuse me. Yeah, no, go ahead, Ms. Mack. Um, I just wanted to clarify an information that Ms. Lowry provided to the board. The cost of this motion was 26 million, not 29.4. That probably didn't include fringe benefits, but our latest um, estimate is just over 27 million um, in salary and 2.2 million for uh, FICA and workers comp, the variable portion of benefits. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, and again, we're we're discussing Ms. Causey's motion. Um, it looks like next is Mr. Kuhn. Thanks, Ms. Scott. Um, the question I have, I'm not quite sure who can answer this. Um, the 15 minutes, I understand adding that to the high school schedule um, and, and the other schedules, but how will it be handled? Do, do elementary schools need 15 more minutes? Are they also the shortest, uh, you know, one of the shortest in the state? Or I, I'm just trying to understand how it will be handled across, you know, elementary, middle, and high school, or if it's just going to be, boom, we've, we've increased the length of the day 15 minutes in, in every setting. Thank you. Ms. Lowry, if you can respond, I don't know if Mr. Duke is on the line. Hello, I don't hear anyone speaking. Hello? Uh, Dr. Williams, I can um, take a stab at it if Ms. Uh, Lowry is not available. Just from what we looked at in the past, the high school requirements um, are longer, and that's the area where we were um, falling short when there was a lot of snow days. The uh, requirements for elementary and middle school are less, but uh, the way the proposal is set up and the way the TABCO contract set up, as well as um, the other uh, unions that would have their day extended is it's um, would have to likely be all or nothing. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to have a different salary structure for high school versus elementary teachers, for instance. So everyone would get the extended day. And just to follow on that, and thank you, because that's that's the direction I'm trying to take this question. Um, would some of this go to would be would some of this be able to go to planning? versus uh, class time or because I don't hear a delineation. I just hear we're adding 15 minutes to the school day. So does does that lock us in? I, I'm not quite sure operationally how that that works. Mr. Kuhn, this is Mr. Saris. That is something that would have to be negotiated. Planning time is part of the TAPCO agreement and so 
Uh, it's currently 250 minutes per week, and this could affect that and and would have to be agreed upon by the parties. All right, so in essence, the motion is to say, here's the money that it would cost to fund 15 more minutes for instruction or for of time in school every day. That's that's it. Yeah, and when we did a sort of uh, two years ago, we extended the day in a way by five minutes and and it was done across the board in a as Mr. Tantliff explained, this would be considerably more, uh, but it would presumably be similar across all levels. Thank you. All right, uh, next it looks like we have. Um, Miss, Miss Scott, I'd like to say something when you get a chance, Rod McMillian. OK, Rod, um, ahead of you, we have um, Dr. Hager and Mr. Offerman, but I'll make sure that I uh, have you after Mr. Offerman. Thank you. Yep, go ahead, Dr. Hager. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just have a question and a comment. My question is uh, clarification that this additional 15 minutes would not shorten the number of school days required in a school year. Is that correct? Correct. It would not impact the number of days. Okay. Right. That, that, that is, yeah, that's a set by MSDE. Okay, good. I just wanted to hear that out loud. Um, and then my comment is that um, as a parent before joining the school board, I didn't understand the utility of this motion. And since joining the school board and having lots of conversations with uh, with folks in school buildings, it really is to me a very important motion that will help us get more in line with teacher salaries and school times throughout the state. And so I. Um, I do support this motion and I do see the utility in doing this for our teachers. That's it. Thanks. Uh, next, Mr. Offerman. Yes, the only uh, I am I'm in full support of adding of adding the uh, the uh, time. I have two concerns. One is that uh, the word the word prioritize. Since this will have to be a, I assume, a item that we have to work work with uh, with uh, with excuse me with Tabco. Uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, it, it, you know, I, I guess what I'm really wondering is is if in fact we do go ahead and and prioritize this, and that's the word we used for the uh, 29 million dollars. Are we going to cut other things? Uh, that's that's that that. Uh, that is sort of my main concern, and and the second thing is 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 just a comment, and that is uh, I agree with uh, Miss uh, Miss uh, Miss Pastor that I think we need to look at a, a a full range of things that we want to do, not only to increase time, but 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 to increase the way we compensate all of our teachers. Thank you. Sorry, thank you for that, Mr. Offerman. Next, we have Mr. McMillian. Thank you. The recruitment and retention of teachers is at a crisis stage. I agree with Ms. Pastor that we target this $29 million toward consolidating the steps. In 10 years, that's approximately $290 million that we can utilize within the salary structure. And my strategy would be with the state make the state mandate that to us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. It looks like we had a follow up question from Ms. Mack. Yes, I'd just like to um, respond to Mr. Kuhn's question uh, and point out that right now with even, I think even with the 15 minutes, primary teachers are required to cover recess duty. Students in intermediate grades, but those teachers have that 30 minutes of rec um, recess, but the teachers are able to use that time as planning time as they do not have to cover recess duty. So there's an inequity already in the system, whereas um, primary teachers have to cover recess. They're not in their um, offices or in their classrooms planning while other teachers do have that option. So I'm hoping that this motion, which I fully support, will address that. 
Thank you. And um, we should be ready to take a vote, but um, Ms. Causey, it looks like you want to speak still to your motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to address some questions and comments that have been made previously. Um, Mr. Uh, Billy Burke, our uh, recently retired Chief of Organizational Effectiveness, uh, did a system-wide school day task force uh, evaluating the um, a, this exact question, extending the school day along with secondary schedules in the start of the school day. So uh, that was a rather uh, robust process. And at the end, this is the recommendation that his task force made to the board, uh, which the board included um, in the last <clears throat> budget cycle, uh, but the funding was uh, not provided by the county executive. Um, this is a way to immediately uh, increase the salary of our teachers for the work that they're already doing, as well as the um, pandemic has uh, really impacted our students. So every minute that we can provide to them as an additional instructional day as soon as possible is really going to be important. And one of the issues with the or one of the factors that came out in the school day task force is by having this extra 15 minutes a day, the uh, principals and schoolhouse leaders would be able to organize that time according to their school's needs. We know that TABCO has consistently been asking for additional planning time, and that was part of the discussion of the school day task force is that this would uh, provide time for each schoolhouse uh, to evaluate whether planning time could be used, um, extra recess time for students in elementary school, um, <clears throat> and then that's a low supervisory um, activity. And so then the teachers may be able to have more planning time related to that. Um, right. Also, I had a question for staff. Um, we're supposed to receive additional $60 million in CARES funding from MSDE, and also the Kerwin override uh, is going to, um, I, the question is, what is the impact of additional funding? And also, what is the additional impact of additional funding announced today uh, by Governor Hogan in terms of addressing the fiscal issues? Uh, okay, um, so are you speaking to your motion or are you asking a question? Because right now we're trying to process the motion. So I'm, I spoke to my motion, but then to follow up with some of my uh, colleagues' questions, I'm asking that question of staff. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to see to make sure that that question is related to your actual motion, because it sounds like that's an, an additional question that can be asked separately, but it doesn't sound like it's related exactly to the motion and what we're doing now is asking and discussing the motion. So um, with that, are there additional questions to Ms. Causey's motion in particular? Uh, it looks like Ms. Jost, you have a question specifically to Ms. Causey's motion? Yes, I believe this motion was processed last year and, and I'm not sure maybe the staff can uh, verify was this cut by the county executive. Um, second, also when I'm talking about planning time, I'll, it's $27 million and we're in the middle of a COVID-19 recession um, that's going to happen. Like Ms. Pastor said, I would rather give that in salaries to the teachers instead of having them work for an extra 15 minutes. But again, there's a lot of negotiation that has to go through with the bargaining unit. So I will not be supporting this motion. Okay. Was there a question you had? You wanted to know if this was... I'm sorry, because I thought you asked a question. Yes, if staff could verify if this was part of the previous budget, adding the 15 minutes. I believe in 2019 we had added, it was about $25 million back then for the additional 15 minutes. I'm not sure if that passed, but I, I believe it was removed by the county executive. So if somebody from in staff could answer that. Mrs. Yes, Sayer. that's correct. Yes, the board that. adopted and the county exec did not put it forward in his budget for the county council. But but it was approved by this board, correct? Correct, the board adopted that. All right, thank you. It looks like, um, Ms. Pester, you had an additional question? No? Yes, okay. no, thank um, you. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm stuck here because if it's not going towards them having some teachers 
having something that they can, where they can improve instruction, um, prepare towards that instruction. And I'm not hearing that in the conversation because I know that schedulers now are going to have to kick in. And if it happens this year and we're bringing people back, it'll impact um, uh, well, it, it's next year, it's next fiscal, but it will impact on the way they do their scheduling. And that might mean that it is not going towards planning. It might be going towards passing time, haul time, any number of things. I, I, I'm just stuck on how we encumber that amount of money and, and not giving teachers a, a bigger salary, a lump, having that 27 million to put towards um, salary. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Pestor. It looks like Ms. Hen has a question. We haven't heard from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to be clear, and I am supporting this motion, this does provide compensation. This is not a motion that's anything but compensation. So let's not fool ourselves as to what this is. We are compensating staff for hours and time that they are already giving us. And this is a small step toward making them whole, but it's an important step. And that's why I will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have a question from Ms. Fo. Yes, I would like um, to ask, Ms. Pasteur keeps equating this to um, money for expanding steps and colas and i'm not following why she thinks doing this would mean we're not doing that i'm not i would like her to clarify her points may i, I like to understand what she's talking about may i yes miss pastor thank you if you encumber 27 million dollars every year because it'll be every year and i i hear what miss hen just said um, I understand that it is money on them. It is base money. So whatever COLA or little percentage we give does fall on top of it. But every single year that I've been on the board, we um, piecemeal and penny pinch trying to find whether we're going to give a pittance of a COLA, a pittance of a step. That is money that could be used as we're looking at compression. Now, if we are going to give them something like the 15 minutes, even though that may sound small, and as schedulers are working through the schedule of the day, then at least you confirm that you are giving them money at least for the 15 minutes. But if schedulers are just trying to create a longer day and there is nothing that is an essence in it that is going to improve instruction, then that's a problem. And that is why I was, even though it is moot now, hanging on to holding back on this motion because it is something that teachers and administrators, particularly schedulers, need to be able to embrace and see what is the best solution for our teachers as opposed to just throwing it out there. I think our teachers are worth more than that. And yes, Ms. Han, I do understand that it is money, but I'm looking at larger pots of money for our teachers every year. Okay. Bye. Thank you for that. So I think that it's time now that we should um, vote on this motion. It's already almost 830 and we've not processed one motion yet. And um, we're just working our way around the dais. And, and I think that um, we need to um, process this motion. So um, if we could, um, all those who are, um, all those who are in favor, you know, please say yes when your name is called. Those who are opposed to the motion, please say no when your name is called. Ms. Gover, if we could take the roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. 
Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six, opposed is five. Okay, and so to pass it needed how many, seven? Six. Six. Oh, it's six, okay. I want to make sure, so the motion then passes. All righty. Okay, thank you. So that motion passes. Um, the motion as um, Ms. Causey put it into chat at um, 15 minutes. Okay, all right. So um, Ms. Causey, did you have anything additional or can we move on to the next um, member so they can ask their questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I. I think the buzzer said that I was out of time, uh, but I'm not sure. So I'll yield right now. Thank you. All right, then next is Ms. Lisa Mack. Yes, I have three questions and two motions. Um, since FY18 actuals curriculum instruction, other charges have increased by almost $9 million from FY21 adjusted to FY22 proposed alone, increases over 3 million. What is included in other charges and what accounts for such significant increases? Uh, Ms. Mack, which page are you looking at? Page 246. So the biggest driver, as we briefly mentioned in the overview, uh, is non-public placements, and that has increased significantly um, every year. As not only the number of students enrolled and placed, but the cost of those placements. So Mr. Saris, what percent of the $3 million increase from FY21 to proposed FY22 is, um, is what percent of the 3 million is non-public placements? Virtually all of it, I would think. Also is the there? parent reimbursements, George. Yeah. Between parent reimbursements and non-pub, that's the whole increase. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is, um, when comparing FY20 actual curriculum and instruction salary and wages with FY21 adjusted, there is an increase of $6.7 million. I'm sorry, scratch that question. Um, in Appendix E, curriculum instruction with no changes in full-time equivalents, um, can you please explain the fluctuations in salary and wages of those two FTEs of 464,000 in the FY20 actual, 1.7 million in the FY21 adjusted, and 926,000 in the FY22 proposed? I'm sorry, Ms. Mack. What, well, what are you looking That's at? Page What's 254. Page? page 254. Okay. Well, what I'm going to say before I even get to the page is um, the only change in compensation in FY21 um, was a 1%, well, it, the 1% COLA actually uh, was not quite in the budget, but you're comparing actuals to budget. So uh, that's comparing vacancies the prior year to fully budgeted in um, 21. So there's almost always going to be a lot of volatility. If you look at any office, unless they were 100% fully staffed all year. But to answer a very granular question like that, we would have to uh, go research it and get back to you after the meeting. OK, I will submit but generally that that's what happens when you see the actual one year compared to the um, budget the next year. And there's no you know, major change in uh, FTEs or anything like that. But on page 254, Mr. Tantliff, there's only two FTEs. That's my concern. Yeah, the highlights on page 253 indicate that those were part of the adjustments to uh, achieve yeah. the uh, cost of living increase for the remain for all of the employees in the system. And the biggest part of that was in uh, stipends and professional. Yeah development um, that is managed by curriculum and instruction along with organizational effectiveness. Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I hadn't got to the actual office page yet. Okay, yeah, thank so. you. 
Um, in my budget question submitted February 5th, I ask how does BCPS per pupil by activity cost compare to other Maryland LEAs? And the response provided by, by staff was the answer is still being researched and answer is forthcoming. Do we have that answer? Um, generally, uh, speaking, we did look at kind of the five largest systems. And if you look at activities, a percent of the budget were, we're fairly, uh, at the average in just about every activity. OK, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm now putting a motion. Um, in the chat. And I will read my motion. Um, I move to amend the proposed budget for FY 2022 to include an increase of 35.6 FTEs in the number of support staff position as follows. School counselors, 18, social workers, five, health assistants, 10, bloat nurses, two, and a nurse for the ESOL bus, um, 0 0.06. Second, Ms. Causey. May I speak to my motion, please? Okay, um, yes, let me restate it though, because it has not been properly moved. Oh, I'm sorry, before. go ahead, thank you. Yep, so um, the motion has been properly moved and seconded um, by Ms. Um, Mac and seconded by Ms. Causey and the motion is I move to amend and um, let me see I move to amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022 to include an increase of 35.6 FTEs in the number of support staff positions as follows school counselors 18 FTE social workers 5 FTEs, health assistant, FTEs 10, float nurses, plus two FTEs, nurses for ESOL, bus 0 0.06 FTE. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, yes, now you may speak to your motion. Um, I've said this before, but I'll just reiterate it. Our students are living through a pandemic that has changed how they access education. It has changed for many of our students, their home lives, their parents, many have lost jobs. Uh, many of our students have lost um, family members to the disease. And as we all know, many, many of our students are experiencing food insecurities. Um, some are continued food insecurities and some are food insecurities for the first time. And if ever we needed additional support personnel, we need it now. And, and as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the most important needs in this budget. And that is why I made this motion. Okay, uh, looks like there's a question from Ms. Jose. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. So my question is, what is an ESOL bus? If staff could answer this and one ESOL bus for one nurse for an ESOL bus, what is an ESOL bus? First of all, that um, if somebody could answer that. Yes, hi, Ms. Uh, Jos, Jos, I will begin and then I'll invite Ms. Shea to fill in any additional details. Um, we, as you know, our ESOL um, population continues to grow and right now our ESOL Welcome Center is located at the CCBC Randallstown um, campus and so it's really um, geographically difficult to access for um, many of our ESOL families that are new and enrolling. What we have been working towards is creating an ESOL bus similar to our parent um, information bus um, that we could actually dispatch the bus to different locations, particularly in August as we're going towards the summertime uh, to be able to create um, an additional location to help enroll families to make it more convenient for families to access enrollment and information that we have to support them transitioning into our school system. Um, this has been a, a, a lengthy process. I have been working to try to get the ESOL bus up and active for six years now. And I think Ms. Shea, perhaps you could provide us an update on where we are because it's, we've been sort of slowly making progress uh, over time. Sure, um, can you hear me okay? On my microphone? Yes. yes. Um, so thank you for that, Dr. McComas. You described it perfectly. It's really an opportunity for us to broaden our outreach in the community to support registration for welcoming our families of English learners. 
um, as well as immunization and um, credit evaluation. Uh, currently, the outside or exterior of the bus, I believe, has been completed. Um, we are now uh, moving into the phase where they will be outfitting the interior of the bus, where they need to bring together different trades to support uh, structural changes to the interior of the bus to make it fully functional in the way that you've described. So, Ms. Shea, if you're talking about an ESOL bus, what is the nurse going to be doing in the ESOL bus? She clearly won't be vaccinating those students in the bus. So if it's just for transportation, what is the purpose of the nurse in the bus? And is that something you guys um, staff is, is requesting or is that something that would be helpful to me? It, it sounds a bit discriminatory, a nurse for an ESOL bus. So uh, if you could help me understand that better. Sure, so I, I can't necessarily speak to Ms. Max motion this evening um, in terms of um, the intent for the nurse, but I will say that while part of what the nurse does in our welcome center um, is about um, having that, we do um, have a nurse station intended for within the bus to provide information for families regarding required immunization and health records um, as part of the registration process. So, um, Certainly, if we were given one, we would use it <laughs> appropriately, um, but we have not uh, pursued that to date because, as Dr. McComas said, we were first focused on actually having the bus um, before we made that kind of request. Okay, thank you. So what would the ESOL nurse do? Would she be in the bus or in the center? Uh, and if she's in the bus, what would she do once the buses are not running? So also we ha just have one center so i really would like to see maybe another center in the west in the east side as well if there's just one in randallstown and if staff could also if dr williams if you could answer um to ms max uh, fte positions that she's adding how that would affect the budget and uh, how relevant that is i can answer how how much it would affect the budget every um everything i've asked for comes to 1.99 million dollars is that something BCPS provided or is that you Googling? Um, I actually took it from the budget. Can staff verify that number, please? And I'd be happy to break it out by position. We have, um, We'd have to research that. Uh, for instance, uh, if we look at, uh, at counselors, I can tell you that 10 counselors are 723,000 uh 626 so 18 we could you know we're looking at um you know mr saris saris that's how i did it yeah so uh social work five social workers are 352,000 um two health assistants 141,000 the float you know so we can a lot of these numbers the baseline data is there uh but we would as Mr. Tantlow said, want to just take some time to make sure we get the numbers exactly right and allocated to your FTEs and it would not be a major task. And that includes benefits, so around two million dollars. Um, it's probably going to be more than that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that might be actually a pretty good estimate, Ms. Jess. Thank All you, right, Mr. Thank you. thank you for that. Uh, looks like we have a question from Mr. Kuhn. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> my question is, it says 0.6. Or, or 0.06, I didn't quite understand what 0.06 of a person is. Lisa, I believe in your- oh, um, and, Yeah, Mr. Kuhn, I took this right from Dr. Williams' proposed budget last year. Okay, so I guess Dr. Williams, I guess- uh, Yeah, 0 0.6, 0 .06 is, is somebody who yeah. works three days a week, basically. But the request yeah, so. seems seems to be for 0.06. Is that accurate? Yes, 
for somebody who's working three days a week in the ESOL center. Okay. Ms. Mack, Eric Brusades here. Just a, a, a clarifying point in your in the chat. It talks about 35.6 FTEs. And then when you get down to the nurses for the ESOL bus, it says I'm sorry, point, zero six. So that I think that is Mr. Kuhn's question. Is it point oh six or point I'm six? I'm sorry, it's point zero six. Excuse me. Thank you for that clarification. Um I think the number that Dr. Williams proposed last year was 0 0.6 FTEs. Uh, but, well, then my, then the 35.6 is correct. I apologize for the confusion. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Referring to last year's um, budget, um, it was a $2.1 million around safe and supportive environment. Thank you, Mr. Sayers where we identify counselors, social workers, psychologists, health assistants, and the ESOL welcome bus nurse. And the question at hand, it was 0.6 of a nurse for the ESOL bus. Thank you, Dr. Williams. You're welcome. And I just went ahead and did the math. Um, the total is $2,436,000, and we would want to verify with Mr. Tantliff uh, whether or not that includes benefits, and I don't believe it would, but we would add that uh, amount to that total. Okay, so then that brings the question because as the motion is stated, it's I stated as 0 0.06, and it sounds like it's actually 0.6. But in the total at the top, it's 35.6, so that is correct. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's see. Thank you for that, Mr. Coon. I'm sorry. Did you have additional questions? Were you finished? That's all, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask uh, again and have staff uh, respond about the funding. Um, Dr. Karen Salmon, State Superintendent, had said, I guess it was a month ago, um, about an additional 61 or $62 million in CARES funding coming to Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, also, the legislature um, did vote for an override on the Kerwin um, bill. And so I'm wondering if staff have preliminary projections on the funding that could come from that to support these objectives. And also the uh, Governor Hogan announced today an additional 1.5 billion supplemental budget focused on education, additional resources to support safe reopening of schools, childcare, local health departments, and um, housing counseling. And there's you know, an additional list. And that's in addition to the initial uh, proposed government excuse me, governor's budget um, that also has um, record funding for education in it. If, if I could, again, um, I appreciate your questions, Ms. Causey. We, we all do, but the discussion is on Ms. Mack's motion. Um, I'm sure staff can certainly address your questions later, but right now we're trying to stay focused on Ms. Mack's motion and process her motion. So yes, do you have I a question about the motion at hand? I absolutely do. This is absolutely uh, relevant. Other uh, board member questions were answered related to um, funding and other issues from staff. So I'm just asking that um, staff provide an answer on the additional funding that's been made available to the school system through the state superintendent and then through the legislature legislature's actions on Kerwin and uh, now there's additional Point of order this is not relevant to the discussion going on the excuse me if i may excuse me um board members please so that we can have an orderly meeting that's what I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we stay on task and we ask questions and right now what we're processing is miss max motion um you know all questions are relevant and we certainly want to get to each of those but 
um, we need to make sure that we process Ms. Mack's motion. So if there's any questions directly to Ms. Mack's motion, um, they're welcome so that we can process that and, and, and move along. Um, so, uh, you know, again, questions that you raise, you know, will be addressed, but do we have any questions specifically about the motion on the floor? Madam Chair, maybe I could restate my motion. Can anyone- well, no, no, we already have a motion. I, I'm mean? sorry, let me restate my question. Um, can anyone from staff speak to uh, the additional funding and the possibility of it being utilized to support these FTEs as it relates to the motion. Okay, is there is is that is that a question that staff can answer? Ms. Calza, can you state the question one more Madam time? Chair, this is okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Scriven. I I would I would respond to the first part of the question that um, the reference to the CARES Act is to look at providing additional support to students um, instructionally. So that may be additional programming, tutoring, um, summer programs, looking at providing additional support uh, while we were in all virtual and as we phase into in-personal, the thought was to use those funds to support our students instructionally. Um, knowing that 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 money will subs will sunset at some port so therefore looking at ways to provide additional opportunities um, for our students and additionally uh, using funds uh, if there's any professional learning that we've talked about before um, any training for our staff um, so knowing that grant money will end um, we were looking at what we can do immediately with our students, uh, looking at a focus on instruction um, and, and knowing that there's an end date of the grant. That's, that's my response to that first question. I won't be able to speak to uh, the additional uh, points about Governor Hogan. Again, looking at all the materials and resources we can provide to our schools to um, look at a, a safe reopening, but I don't know if Dr. Scriven or Mr. Sarris want to add to any of that. Dr. Williams, I'll, I'll just add one thing. Uh, Ms. Causey asked about the blueprint override. That has no impact on FY22 because um, FY 2022 was uh, fully funded for blueprint, so we already have all those dollars in um, our budget and they have you know where they have specific purposes they're targeted towards that and where they're in the general fund it's it was basically flat uh two year ago for stuff like the teacher incentive grant and special ed the ramp up comes in the out years that's really what they um passed was uh you know in year 10 having a significantly higher funding level that ramps up Okay. Yes, and this is George Saris. The the 1.5 billion is not direct aid to in education. Uh, the very important thing that the governor's budget included last month when he unveiled it was the hold harmless funding, um, which will be very important to us in FY22. Um, and uh, Mr. Tanliff is right on point with regard to Kerwin, the big impact won't be for another few years. All right, thank you for that. I appreciate the um, responses from staff. Again, you know, it, it's we, we really need to process and stay focused on the motion at hand. So um, I believe it's time um, for a vote. So Ms. Gover, if you could take a roll call vote, please. All those who are in favor, um, of the motion, please say yes when your name is called. Those who are opposed, please say no when your name is called. Ms. Gover, if we could take a vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe? Ms. Causey? Yes. 
Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ten in favor, one opposed. All right, looks like the motion passes. So um, we will add these positions to the budget. And now we will, um, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Matt, uh, did you have additional? Yes, questions? I have one more motion um, and I'm sending it to you right now. Well, putting it in the chat for all of us. <laughs> but yes, I, I absolutely want to make sure that, you know, we are, Stating these correctly, so I Ms. appreciate Mack that. Ms. Mack I can't hear her. I, I'm sorry. I move to amend the proposed budget for FY 2022 to reflect that all bargaining units receive a 2% COLA subject to negotiation, at least a 2% COLA subject to negotiation and agreement if necessary. Second row. Okay, so it has been moved and seconded that the um, board amend the budget to um, board amend the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022 to reflect that all bargain all bargaining units receive at least two percent cola subject to negotiation and agreement if necessary and it has been seconded by Ms. Sorrell is that correct correct okay sorry having a little trouble hearing you Ms. Sorrell all right um may I speak uh, to my motion worries. yes Ms. Mack please do um it's incomprehensible to me that in a $1.7 billion budget that schoolhouse personnel were not given adequate consideration for the, their heroic efforts this year. Even though the proposed budget includes a step increase for eligible employees, that increase does not even make them whole because last year teachers did not get a step increase. Um, a local schools PTA has been posting testimonials every day um, in support of teachers and all schoolhouse employees. And when you read them, it, 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 it makes it very clear that we would not even have made it this far without the heroic efforts of everybody, school counselors, custodians, teachers. Um, who have stepped up to make this as tenable as it is. And just like my last motion, um, I feel very strongly that this is the right thing to do. Thank you. All right, looks like Ms. Rowe would like to speak to the second. Yes, I, it has always struck me as being the strangest thing in the world that we could have state, federal, and county employees who get COLAs routinely and in the same year they're getting colas, our teachers somehow wouldn't. And I just don't think that's fair. So that is why I seconded this motion. All right, thank you, Ms. Rell. Looks like we have Ms. Pastor. Uh, I, I, thank you, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, that the motion speaks to all of the folks who impact um, our students is admirable and it needs to happen um, for bus drivers, custodians, everyone it needs to happen. Uh, and I hope that we are also as a system taking a look at how we can sustain this behavior and movement year after year, and I'm gonna keep saying that and harping on it until we have a mindset of not making this piecemeal, but that every year we uh, show our appreciation for what our folks do, whether it's a pandemic or not. Thank you.
Miss Scott, this is Miss Joes. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I was muted. Um, Miss Joes, did you have a question? Yes, to uh, Dr. Williams about um, this particular motion. If you could um, address the financial impacts of it. Thank you, Ms. Joes. I would have to turn to Mr. Sarris and Mr. Tanliff um, uh, as we look at this before. So one of you can respond, please, financially. What would that look like? Sure. Uh, Ms. Joes, it'd be about 20.5 million to support a 2% call up um, for all employees. And is that us going into operations into the bargaining unit with this particular motion? Maybe Dr. Williams or some Ms. Lowry can answer that question or Mr. Duke. So, um, yes, it's it is one of the requests that came um, from TAPCO um, as well as the other bargaining units um, had asked for steps and COLA of 2%. Um, TAPCO um, was looking at it um, from a different perspective of wanting to commit um, funds that would um, do the reorganization of the salary scale. Um, in addition to adding the, the 15 minutes. So, um, you know, it's a portion of what they asked for as far as TAPCO is concerned. OK, thank you, Ms. Lowry. Thank you for that. It looks like we have a uh, comment rather from Ms. Lisa Mack. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I think we need to recognize as big as our county is, our teachers, all of our employees have other options and I think if we want to keep our teachers and keep our custodians and our administrators we need to compensate them fairly and um, I think I, I, I think two percent doesn't even get us close but I think it's a good start. Thank you Ms. Mack. And uh, it looks like we're ready to take a vote. Oh, Ms. Jones, you have an additional question? No, no, no. Go ahead, take the vote. Sorry. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like there is a comment from Dr. Hager. Um, I just wanted to comment um, as you know, this is my first budget process, and I, I'm continually told that our budget reflects our priorities, and I really I agree with Ms. Mack that our teachers should be our priority because our students are our priority and they really need teachers in the classroom. Um, and one thing that I did do when I went through the budget book was I looked at the percent increases in salaries and wages across the different departments. And uh, the school building salaries decreased the least next to the our little board of ed um, budget, but compared to the superintendent's budget, the business services budget and the curriculum and instruction budget were double what um, is in the school buildings. And so I do think that it's time to prioritize um, this motion, and I, I do support what, what the, the motion that's been put forward. Okay. All right, so I think, um, Ms. Gover, um, are you ready for the roll call vote for this motion, for yes. Ms. Matt's motion? Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is 11. Okay, looks like the motion carries. Okay. And okay, Ms. Scott, we, I'm finished. Oh, okay, thank you for that, Ms. Mack. So now we'll go around the desk to Mr. McMillian. Uh, my questions were very similar in nature to Ms. Rose's questions about magnet schools, so I'm prepared to pass at this point. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, Mr. McMillian. Next, we have Ms. Jose. Thank, thank you, Ms. Scott. I, I do want to. Um, 
state that earlier today the audit committee meeting had met and we had a LEA, the local education agency um, appropriation comparison to show how BCPS compares to neighboring uh, districts, Harford County, PG County, Anne Arundel, Frederick, etc. And it is still a draft version that PowerPoint is in the board docs. And um, the reason I mentioned that is because we looked at the appropriation for salaries, instruction, special education, and myriad other items in which um, you know we fall right in the median Baltimore County Public Schools. So because there's always a narrative that so we could definitely pay our instructional staff more, but we're right in the middle median and we don't pay any more, any less than any other jurisdictions. And with that, I also want to note that last year we had a position in the superintendent staff or chief of communications position, which is now being handled by the chief of staff. So, you know, I want to make a quick thank you to Mr. Dickerson. He's doing two positions while being paid for one. So with that, I'm done. Thank you. No motions. Thank you, Ms. Jose, and we'll move around the dais now to Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one question and a few motions. My first question is on page 137, and that is the line item for the Chief Communications Officer. Um, can staff please clarify that that position is vacant or the intent of that? It has a line item or a proposed allocation of $891,421. Um, Ms. Hen, what, uh, well, the chief communications officer was uh, eliminated, so that position does not um, exist. Could you uh, clarify which page you're on? Yes, Mr. Tantliff, page 137. Um, okay, and then did you have a, uh, another question? No, thank I'm you. Not, I'm sorry. That was my one question. Okay. Um, my first motion is I move that the board amend the fiscal year 22 budget to add a chief information officer position with a budget allocation of 200,000 to oversee the Department of Information Technology and to support the Department of Educational Options, including the Office of Innovation and Digital Safety, Library Media Programs and Digital Resources, Blended Learning, E-Learning, and the Home and Hospital Program. Second, Mark. Okay, sorry, uh, I was muted. Um, would you please put that uh, language into the chat, Ms. Hen? I wouldn't feel comfortable repeating it without the appropriate verbiage. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. You. It is in the chat. And may I speak to my motion? Uh, well, I need to state it first so that it can be the property of the assembly and it'll be on the floor, then you may speak to it. So uh, it looks like um, Ms. Hen has moved that the board uh, amend, it's been moved and seconded uh, that the board amend the fiscal year 2022 budget to add a chief information officer position with a budget allocation of $200,000 to oversee the Department of Information Technology and to support the Department of Educational Operations, including the Office of Innovation and Digital Safety, Library Media Programs and Digital Resources, blended learning, e-learning, and the home and hospital program. And it was seconded by, um, was that Ms. Mack? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, yes. <laughs> Ms. Um, Han, if you could please speak to your motion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. Given the recent ransomware attacks and also the need for additional investment in our virtual learning platform, it's an the board needs to provide strategic leadership in our IT area. And there is a need to coordinate that leadership across areas that require um, such strategic ideas, innovation, and coordination. This position would provide that level, higher level strategic leadership position in a chief that would coordinate with the cabinet and be available to the board to also provide um, direction and advisement in terms of resources. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have a question from Mr. Offerman. I would like Dr. Williams to uh, speak to uh, how how the how uh, 
how, how these things are being handled now and and would this be uh, a uh, a real benefit to the uh, to the, the uh, to our to our process? Thank you. Mr. Offerman, this so is thank uh, you, Mr. Offerman. I'll go ahead, Doc. No, go ahead, Dr. Scriven. <laughs> no, I was just I was just jumping in because and, and, and then Dr. Williams, please um, take the rein. Um, but Mr. Offerman, th this is a position that really already exists under uh, business services where where I am currently the chief and where Jim Corns is currently the executive uh, director. Uh, a lot of uh, what was stressed in the motion is something that currently sits in our shop. Um, I, I'm, I'm leery to go into a lot of detail uh, around the, the ransomware. Um, I, I'm feeling, uh, that I need to uh, be careful with my comments, um, but this ransomware could have happened to uh, anyone at any time. I, I don't think that there's anything uh, that this motion, uh, if, were, if it were in place prior to the ransomware, would have had any additional impact or not. I, I can't speak to that. Uh, but in looking at how we're addressing and moving forward, um, our process is very fluid for us to be where we currently are uh, under the conditions and the challenges that we've been faced with. So it's, um, it's a layer that exists, which really is coming on the school-based side, which would really be a reorg, um, which again, that's that fine line with being in operations. And Dr. Williams, please feel free to jump in, sir. So the only thing I would just add, thank you, Dr. Scriven, is that when we add positions such as this, um, we the amount here may not be sufficient as you have heard earlier today about the benefits and all that must come with it. Um, and then to um, provide oversight for certain offices, again, um, I will yield to the comments earlier, but um, I think Dr. Scriven provide um, insight about the current state. And then I would just question whether we create a new central office position. And I would also question and the team can work out what that budget line item would cost. I'm not sure if the allocation would be sufficient. If I may as well, Dr. Williams, I'd just like to uh, offer for the benefit of everyone that uh, the instructional programs that Ms. Hen identified specifically in that motion really do require someone with instructional expertise. Um, I certainly recognize Ms. Hen uh, that a chief information officer would certainly need technical expertise in terms of uh, digital security, as you mentioned, but I, I cannot emphasize the importance of the instructional expertise as well, uh, because while I, um, it's important to understand that there's a great deal of operational aspects to running each and every one of those programs, whether it's e-learning, home and hospital, um, or any of the other ones that were listed there, and we do currently have uh, that and right now it is uh, being supported through the leadership of Dr. Wisted. Thank you. Okay, it looks like next we have uh, Ms. Jose. Uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. A lot of my questions were answered by Dr. Williams, but I do want to state that as the superintendent, he designates his organizational structure. There has, uh, we do have a Chief, is it information uh, technology officer, Dr. Williams, which is Mr. Corns. And to the best of my understandings, he's done a excellent job. He, I believe he was a teacher or has a teaching certificate from, um, you know, without saying much about the ransomware, the response was great. Would this position be below Mr. Jim Corns? And there's always a rhetoric from certain uh, portions of the county that the central office is too heavy. So I'm kind of concerned about why you would add another central office position when Dr. Williams uh, doesn't think it's necessary. I won't be supporting this motion. I would rather put that money into the schoolhouse than create another redundant position. 
Thank you for that, um, Ms. Jose. And if Mr. Corns could answer if he has a teaching certificate, because I think that is relevant to, uh, and he's pretty high up, and would that position be below him? And um, if he could answer that. Yes, Mr. Corn. I, I can answer that for him. He, yes, he is certified um, to teach, and he keeps that current. Um, a chief position would not be under Jim Corns in our current structure. Um, a chief position is a position uh, where I currently sit and Jim Corns and EDs in that position report up to the chief. So would he be reporting to Mr. Jim Corns, he or she? No, no ma'am, if, if it's a, a chief, Oh, so, okay, gotcha, gotcha. The other way around. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. And next, uh, we have Ms. Rowe. So I'm going to be supporting this motion and possibly for a different reason than what other people who are supporting the motion might be. The reason I'm supporting the motion is because one of the things that this pandemic has taught us is that virtual instruction is not only possible, but for some students it may even be beneficial. And when we have the Department of Educational Options and we have the Office of E-Learning, and then we have Department of Juvenile Services, and we have um, Home and Hospital, and we have all of these um, different types of things that could benefit from a singular source of leadership instead of having each office operate in silos because we haven't really served all those communities as well as we could if the technology were all entirely coordinated and i think it requires one leadership position because i see no reason why we can't offer virtual instruction on a regular basis to specific populations that require it or do well that previously we've given only six hours of home and hospital instruction a week to. So I'm supporting this because I see that chief technology position as being one that could facilitate um, those sorts of things. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, it looks like next we have Ms. Pastor. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I want to piggyback on what Ms. Joe said. Um, spot on. I have counted all of the positions at the top. And having one more way at the top. I calculate how many teachers and it may not seem like many or counselors, social workers that we can get out of that. Yeah, that's where our money needs to go at this point for all of the reasons so many of you have articulated earlier in this meeting. So rather than duplicating, we can do PD, we can strengthen, we can even consolidate and get those positions that are in this. But I'm going to continue to harp on how we streamline I am waiting for Dr. Williams because I know it's in his plan to have an opportunity to take a look at the organizational chart and make some changes so that we can get all of those people about whom uh, Ms. Um, Max spoke and on whom we voted. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next is Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey? Yes. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to refer to policy 2310, administration organization charts, policy statement. To achieve the stated mission and goals of the school system, the Board of Education of Baltimore County must maintain an organizational structure focused on performance, accountability, and meeting the school system's goal of organizational effectiveness. Standards. Annually, the superintendent shall prepare an organization chart and submit it to the board for approval. The organization chart shall include the positions that report directly to the superintendent and positions at the executive director level and above. 
All organizational changes involving positions that report directly to the superintendent or positions at the executive director level and above shall be submitted to the board for its approval. Uh, it is exactly in the purview of the Board of Education to approve organizational changes. I would also refer to um, the Office of Legislative Audit report in that uh, of the multiple repeat findings, uh, a number of them related to IT. And again, we need to ask for what we need and we need to put our money where our needs are. And all of us that have lived through the pandemic understand uh, that uh, the infrastructure needs the highest level attention. It needs uh, expert. Hello, Ms. Causey. Hello, Ms. Causey. Mrs. Yes, you're on mute. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, when did that happen? Uh, you said the highest needs and then that's that's the last that we heard. OK, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> and Dr. McComas's point is very well taken that there needs to be instructional expertise related to technology, um, and that is a piece of it. But as Ms. Hen said, there needs to be a, an overarching um, expertise that addresses all of the needs throughout the system related to technology. Cyber attacks are um, ongoing, unfortunately, and um, it, it's going to be very important to for us <clears throat> to improve how we are doing this, given the, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, the potential increase of using technology in the future, even past the pandemic. Okay, thank you, Ms. Causey. And it oh, looks next we Matt, have Mr. Mahomes up. Oh. Madam Chair, yes. this, is, this is Dr. Scriven. Uh, I would just like Mr. Saris to take a moment uh, to respond to the one point that was just made um, by Ms. Causey, uh, just to provide some clarity, because uh, oh, I'm yes, not I'm I'm not clear on these multiple uh, findings that she's referencing from the last uh, legislative audit. Uh, George, could you speak and just give some clarity on those findings and what they were specifically? and how many repeat findings there were, uh, just so that so, just so that we can be a little more concise, please. Uh, there were three specific uh, information technology findings. Um, I know that uh, we have resolved a number of them since 2015, um, and that, so that's three out of the, the 12 total uh, that we received in November. And and when those findings were, uh, our resolutions were submitted in response to those findings, where, where are we in terms of uh, the legislative audit accepting uh, what we have proposed as next steps? So they, they have accepted our uh, our proposal and I, uh, prior to the ransomware attack, I believe we had planned to wrap up the remaining findings within the next 12 months. Uh, it may be that uh, that some of our actions as a result of the attack uh, have already addressed uh, many of these uh these three findings um but uh i i'm confident that uh that we will resolve them uh in short order all right thank you sir thank you madam chair for allowing us just to add that commentary yes and thank you for um clarification it's always helpful um next we have uh mr mahomes yes um uh, good afternoon Good evening, sorry. Um, I guess my question is, um, what is the some of uh, the role, what are the responsibilities of Mr. Corns and um, the other personnel as it relates to um, uh, this motion, the, the things mentioned in this motion? Are they satisfied already? I guess uh, Dr. Williams or staff uh, would be able to answer that. 
Madam Chair, I would like to clarify my or speak to that. If I may. As far as the, it sounds like Mr. Mahomes is asking about a job description, though, that current staff currently have. So you're speaking to uh, I would a like job to, description. I would like to speak to the CIO role. OK, was that your question, Mr. Mahomes? Though? No, no, I, it's mainly yeah. about the current us. Uh, uh, personnel that we have right now. Yeah, he's speaking about the current personnel. So I guess if Dr. Williams or someone could speak to current personnel and staffing. So right now we do have an executive director over information technology and um, although he's his position is in business services. Um, a part of the work that we have been doing and has been going on is the collaboration <clears throat> with the school side, specifically around the curriculum and instruction. Um, so because of this chief, this proposal of a chief, that would be an additional cabinet member. And um, I yeah. do want to make a comment when we get to that, Miss Madam Chairperson Scott. Yes, and um, apart from Mr. Corns, uh, I think I, I believe it was Ms. Mc, Dr. McComas mentioned another um, individual that handled the home and hospital. Am I correct in that? Yes, Mr. Mahomes, uh, that's correct. So we already have individuals who handle uh, almost all, some, at least some or even all of these um, uh, things mentioned by Ms. N. Yes, in fact, um, if you go back, I'm not sure who's controlling the slides. I think Mr. Corns, if you could go back to, I think it's the third slide, perhaps the fourth one, you'll see all the offices uh, that address uh, the programs. One more, please. Thank you. Uh, I need you to advance it one slide, one slide only. Thank you. Uh, right there, uh, Mr. Mahomza and members of the board, what you'll see to the left of the screen, Department of Educational Options, um, magnet programs, e-learning programs, home and hospital programs, homeschooling, uh, Air Baltimore County Detention Center, the library and media program. So Ms. Ms. Hen is proposing that we take essentially that entire department and merge um, um, under business services and pull that out of instruction. Uh, and I would advocate to maintain those programs within the instructional house but under CNI so that we can ensure that the instructional components are um, maintained. Additionally, I would say I understand and I respect the advocacy around e-learning programs. It's been a long journey. Our school system has gone through um, many conversations with people who were uncomfortable as well as people who are comfortable with digital uh, learning and all the facets that go with it. Uh, and we certainly all know Mr. McMillian is a huge proponent of expanding our e-learning program. I would recommend that as we move forward, we may be better serving our students if we take uh, the funds and direct them into the e-learning program. We currently have, I believe it's about 17 teachers who serve in that program. If we were able to expand the teaching staff in the e-learning program, we could then continue to expand the program. Uh, that would be an operational way uh, and a more uh, budget efficient way of optimizing our resources to do some of what Ms. Hen was just speaking to. Um, and we certainly can continue to explore in the uh, aftermath of um, virtual learning from the pandemic, how how else we can expand and better serve students in whether it's home and hospital or homeschooling. Um, and, and we have been underway with this with our students in the detention center as well. So I offer that for everyone's consideration. Thank you. Well, well, no, uh, I, uh, I'm happy to hear those last comments. Uh, OK, um, my next question is with the uh, 200,000. Uh, um, I'm, 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 I don't know much about like um, salaries and um, where the funding would go to create a new department, but am I might um, mistaken in understanding that the salary of the chief would take up a lot of this allocation of the 200,000. Would that I guess let me rephrase my question. Would the 200,000 satisfy the creation of this whole new um, department or chief position? 
Mr. Mahamza, it, um, it, it, it's a combination of things that are not included in the figure that was uh, quoted, um, because that would not include, for example, um, health care benefits, nor would it provide a budget for that position to be able to work from to, to manage the work of the office. And also, if you are um, adding a chief position, you also have to have um, an admin assistant to support that level. So it would require um, an additional position of support to go with it. Yeah, and sorry, and what I mean by department is like, don't they have like uh, staff members that answer to them? Like um, the business services has like mentioned, Dr. Is it Mr. Corns? Um, 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 the boss of Mr. Corns is uh, one of the chiefs. I, I'm so sorry, I'm bad with names. Um, <laughs> they, they, um, the lower positions answer to the chiefs. So uh, that's what I meant by that. And I, I assume they would need more funding for that. Correct. It would it would require a restructure, um, which would then could possibly create the need for additional um, clerical support staff. Yes. Okay. Uh, my last uh, question, real quick, is um, if we're creating a new position, and, and I, I feel like everybody's uh, um, kind of on the same page. It's just how do we accomplish um, supporting our IT department? But if we're creating new positions, I, I, I don't know how, how can we keep this, some of the positions that we have currently have. Isn't there any overlap if we're creating a chief of IT? Um, how does that relate to like Mr. Corn's position or Dr. Lipstead's position? especially with the roles. If you were creating a chief position, you would be pulling responsibilities from Dr. Scriven, who oversees Mr. Corns. And then um, based upon the description that was given and provided about what the roles and responsibilities were, there would we would have to look at some other restructuring I guess my wondering would be, you know, in, in some cases to um, uh, Dr. Boswell McCumas's point, um, they they don't they don't really live in this within the same structure. So um, it, it it would it would require a great deal of dismantling and moving and recreating which with without looking at all of that and making sure that all of those needs are fulfilled you you could pull something for example from overseeing home and hospital which cre could create a void unintentionally so um, it really requires taking a look at the alignment of of all of that and then making sure that the credentials of the individual the skill set meets all of those areas because not all of them naturally go together. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and next looks like we have Ms. Hen. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. So first to clarify, um, the motion does not require a restructuring. There are no changes that would be necessary for that. It states that this individual would support the, de the departments that are currently under curriculum and in, in instruction. Um, it would be located within IT. So I did want to um, make that point clear. Secondly, this position is in no way, um, this motion in no way discredits Mr. Corns and his role. It is a very different role. His role is operational. He has kept the lights on. He's done a phenomenal job in doing so. This is a very different role. And when I describe it as strategic, it is a thought leader role. It's a visionary. The CIO is someone who envisions what technology will look like for the school system tomorrow. The executive director of IT keeps the lights on today. That is the difference. It's someone who is a member of the cabinet who can provide the IT perspective when other cabinet members make decisions, who can provide that thought leadership and the visionary to say this is what needs to be considered. And when I provided the examples of the ransomware attack and the virtual learning platform, it was only to bring home the point that we are now more aware than ever of the importance of all of our educators, students, everyone within Team BCPS 
of the importance of technology and how critical it is that technology have a seat at the table when we make these decisions. This role provides that seat at the table for someone who can provide the thought leadership, who has the expertise within IT and who can be focused on tomorrow and not in keeping the lights on. It in no way, um, in any way minimizes the impact of Mr. Horns. It is a very different role. So I hope that clarifies the difference. And thank you, Mr. Mahamza, for your questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next looks like we have Dr. Williams. You had a comment? Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair Scott. <clears throat> Uh, board members, I just want to reference what Ms. Causey shared. She shared policy 2310. I am, uh, I am the superintendent. I have the vision for the system. I am the instructional leader with 30 years of experience. So to create a position is really looking at and contrary to what the policy 2310 is. Annually, I prepare an organization chart and submit it to the board for Version charts are inclusions that report directly to the superintendent and positions at the executive director level and above. I have great concerns about this motion. It feels like it is in the operations. I'm serving in this role as superintendent to look at ways um, to make our system efficient and particularly to focus on student outcome and better outcomes for our students. Uh, so I just remind the board about the policy, about what my role is to provide an organizational chart and submit it. Um, this is way into the operations, and I want to echo what uh, Dr. Boswell uh, McComas shared about if there's a need for any additional teachers around e-learning, we welcome that recommendation, but I have great concerns about this motion. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Uh, next, we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm at a slight disadvantage. I had to leave and come back to the the meeting. So, if I if I go over something that may have already been um, uh, covered, I apologize ahead of time. Um, my first question, uh, re because I believe that. Uh, this talked about the chief communications officer and the funding for that position. Um, and I heard earlier that that position no longer exists, but I see funding. So I'm trying to understand that. So is there funding for a chief communications officer? Because I see $891,000 on page 137. Um, so uh, can someone please answer that question? The, um, I believe the chief communication officer position um, was reclassified into the executive director of special education. Okay, so, so that line item should somehow be amended. Uh, do you see what I mean? It's it's on page one thirty seven. It's like the. Under the budget by category administration, there's a chief communication officer line item. Um, uh, yeah, the I reason I ask about uh, that is because I, I believe that Ms. Hen is asking for funding from this position that isn't doesn't exist or hasn't isn't filled in essence so she's not in essence creating a new position and that's the start of of this motion from what i recall mr tanlip this is michael dickerson i believe that line item encompasses the office that was under the chief communications officer yes it's the entire office it's not that is not referring to a position that is referring to the office. And I'm I'm trying to find the actual page and I've, I'm sorry because I'm thumbing through here and I haven't yep. seen it, so. Page 140. Uh, I would just also remind, again, we're, we're debating the, the motion. 
Um, right, but the motion starts so by talking sure about questions. funding. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, but I, I thought the motion, and that's why I'm sorry, I'm at disadvantage. I can't see it in the chat for some oh. reason. It's it's muted on my on my um, on my computer here. I, I thought that the motion talked about taking funding from this category and creating and in essence moving and creating the position. So if I'm wrong, I, I can move on. It's just um, I thought that was kind of the inception of, of where we're starting here. Yeah, no, I'm reading the motion and it says nothing about a communications officer. It, OK, of, yeah. all right, I apologize. I'll, I'll move on. Um, uh, you know, the first thing I'd like to say is, is just to make a comment with you know, the, the ransomware attack and the effects that are across the entire system, we realize how much we rely on systems for this entire enterprise. Um, I believe that a chief information officer um, would, in essence, elevate the support of all IT activity across the agency. And I would suggest that, that that's a useful position to have um, and that they support the entire enterprise, so I, I, I support this measure. Uh, the details about, you know, does it is it taking from this office or that office, I believe can be worked out. But in essence, I believe the position has merit um, and and is is definitely valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, next, it looked like uh, Dr. McComas, you had a comment. Oh, uh, thank you, Ms. Scott. I previously had my comment added, so thank you for the opportunity. Okay, great. All right, next we have Mr. Alferman. I would like to move the question. Okay, is there a second? Second. Oh, and who, who did the seconding? Second, Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones, okay, so the question has been called and seconded. Moved by um, the previous question has been called, so we need to take a vote on that. It's been moved by Mr. Offerman, seconded by Ms. Jose um, to end debate. Ms. Gover, could you take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Cosby? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is seven, opposed is four. OK, so um, I believe to move the question, it requires two thirds majority to pass. Um, so it's seven. And the motion carries. So now we can vote on Ms. Hen's motion. <clears throat> and um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote to vote now on um, the motion that Ms. Hen brought forward. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five, opposed is six. Okay, so the motion, um, the motion fails. All right, moving forward, uh, did you have additional uh, information or questions, uh, Ms. Hen? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a motion. I move that the proposed per pupil allocation for school textbooks be increased as to order and provide textbooks and printed instructional materials for every elementary, middle, and high school student for all courses where a textbook is published and to reallocate funding from the budgeted amount for the purchase of digital materials. 
All right, and I think you already know I'm going to ask you to put that in the chat because I would not even attempt to. <laughs> yep. Um, second, thank you. And it was seconded by Miss Calzy. Thank you. OK, thank you. So the motion has been uh, moved by Ms. Hen and seconded by Ms. Calzy, and I will restate the motion. Ms. Hen moved that the proposed per pupil allocation for school textbooks be increased as to order and provide textbooks and printed instructional materials for every elementary, middle, and high school student for all courses where a textbook is published and to reallocate funding from the budgeted amount for the purchase of digital materials. So it's moved by Ms. Hen, seconded by Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I speak to my motion? Yes, please do. Thank you. So we repeatedly hear from Whoa. families that their students require um, print materials for whatever reason, whether equipment has failed or their students learn best from printed materials. This motion provides the resources necessary for schools to order those print materials and to provide them automatically to students so that they have a backup should their equipment fail. Um, now that again, we're reliant on technology, this provides a backup for those cases and provides learners their preferred instructional um, format. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. And it looks like we have a question. It looks like um, Ms. Uh, Jose, or you said you, uh, Ms. Jose and Mr. Offerman. Um, you said you'd like Mr. Offerman to go first? Yes. Okay, Mr. Offerman. Yes, I'm wondering if there's any way that we can, that, that we can get an estimate on what the cost of this will be. From anybody, Ms. Han or anybody else? Yeah. Okay, does uh, anyone this, have? Sorry, go ahead. This is Mr. Saris. Um, we don't really have a per pupil uh, textbook budget. We have a per pupil budget for schools on which school budgets are based. Um, so it would be helpful to have uh, some more information on how to develop the cost. Okay. Uh, so, it looked like I, Dr. McComas, are you able to answer Mr. Offerman's question? Yes, I think I can add um, information to what Mr. Sarah said, and I think information that would be important for the board to understand in considering this um, proposed motion. Uh, first, I just want to explain um, when we purchase a new set of textbooks, I'll use the Bridges as an example or open court. We in the central office through the central textbook account and the content offices purchase that for the initial distribution for the entire school system. So whatever school uh, we would do that purchase. Additionally, each year we purchase for schools enrollment growth um, that may occur as the school system continues to expand our enrollment. From that point forward, schools, uh, school principals use their budget to purchase replacement books. So if you have 20 physics books and only uh, 18 of them come back at the end of the school year for whatever reason, the principal would then pick up the, the difference in purchasing uh, the replacements for those. At any time, when schools reach out uh, to my offices, rather me directly or Ms. Shea, uh, for support around acquiring print and um, hard copy resources, uh, we never say no. We always support any additional requests that they may have. Um, additionally, I would just like to say that uh, we just spoke about um, expanding our digital resources um, in e-learning, for example, and yet we're working to cut digital resources. So I just want to point out that those digital resources um, are um, also provided through subscription through uh, the central um, budget so that the schools can have access to them by the appropriate grade level um, and content area. Um, and just again, so that everyone here understands how that operationally works uh, day in and day out for your consideration around this. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Did you have additional questions? Uh, only a comment that uh, that well, I think we need to get materials that 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 will make our students successful. I, I have a hard time approving something that, that doesn't have any kind of budget number. 
that's that's just my opinion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, next, we have Dr. Hager. Um, Dr. Was, was Molly ahead of me? I think. Ms. Jost? No. Oh no, Ms. Jost said you could go before her. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, yes, I just had a clarification question. Um, from what I understand, the, what the motion is doing is it's. Uh, providing the opportunity to take online material and print it for students who want hard copies so that we don't need to buy textbooks. Is that what's, what the motion is? Madam Chair, may I respond to Dr. Hager? Oh, yes, please, Ms. Hen. Thank you. It's to ensure that students have textbooks. That That's it, plain and simple. It's um, when there, where there is a textbook available, students should receive one and schools should be able to order them and to receive per pupil allocations that cover, fully cover the cost of textbooks for all courses. And I'm proposing um, reallocating funds that are currently allocated for digital resources to reallocate a portion of those to ensure that we have adequate um, books for all students. Does that answer your question, Dr. Hager? I think so. So if, if I mean, maybe this is for, for Dr. McComas, if, um, if the choice textbook is an online textbook, and there is a print copy. Are are they comparable? Would we order both? Or um, would, yeah, yeah. Great question. So typically, uh, what we see in the marketplace, and this is evolving more and more year by year as digital resources become much more normalized. Uh, typically, when you um, purchase a hard set of textbooks like all of us are familiar with and love, um, you get additional digital um, resources with it. Uh, typically, however, what happens is that the hard book is a one-time purchase typically because you buy it one time. However, that digital resource then typically in the initial purchase comes with a, a life cycle of maybe you get the digital resources as part of the initial purchase for three years or so, and then at the end of those three years, then you have to choose to continue that subscription. Um, process uh, to make it available. The benefit of having, um, and, and science is a great example, Dr. Hager, as you know, we discover new things about science every day. The digital resources tend to be able to be updated much more quickly than, of course, a print copy, which can become outdated. Um, so therein is the benefit of when you have them um, together. I would also just like to add that there is nothing presently in our operational procedures that precludes um, us, uh, you know, uh, if a principal needs a, a copy for a student because that is their learning preference or maybe that's a, a resource, that there's nothing that precludes a principal from doing that now or reaching out to my office for that resource um, and, and helping to find that as well. So there, there's nothing right now that would prevent that from happening otherwise. Okay. Yeah, I guess my my concern with the motion, and I'm a I'm a paper person still. You know, I, I definitely um, am a person who prefers the the textbooks and the paper. Um, but if if it's not comparable, you don't want your students learning different things in the classroom. And so, may, so again, Julie, if if I'm misspeaking to the motion, please clarify. But I I just want to make sure I understand what 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 you're suggesting. The challenge is keeping the the print copy up to date with digital resources. But that's going to be the case in science history. Um, and any of the innovation areas like engineering crafts. Mm -hmm. right, thank you, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Looks like next we have a question from Ms. Jose. Yes, thank you. So a lot of my questions were answered by Dr. McComas. I, I don't really see the point of this motion because this board recently updated a policy where I, Ms. Pastor can probably verify, where we were very explicitly stated that children will, uh, we will provide digital and paper resources for all of our children. And personally, I can vouch that when parents do ask for textbooks, you do get textbooks. My children got textbooks. They even got uh, science kits to do paper, notebooks, uh, middle school and elementary school. So I, I don't see the point of this motion. It already is in policy. BCPS is already implementing it. Uh, if parents ask for textbooks in bigger font, smaller fonts, they are providing it. Dr. McComas just clarified. So I see this as a moot uh, motion. I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jones. Next we have Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Textbooks, it's one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> uh, Dr. McComas, you and I get to talk nonstop about this. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I have and from this discussion um, 
what I'm starting to glean is you talk about, in essence, purchasing the initial central, you know, the central office, you know, when you move to something new, you, you make a massive purchase, right? And then yeah. over time, your expectation is that um, you're, in essence, saying here's the original set and then any additions in the future need to come out of um, school specific budgets. And I if guess yeah, if I just may clarify, that would be for replacements, not expansion. So if you are a school where you've suddenly had a huge growth in your population and you now need two or three additional sets of books because of enrollment growth, my uh, teams pick that up. Um, it's the replacement um, for maintenance. OK, I guess that's part of what doesn't seem clear to me because I'm happy to hear that Miss Jose and um, her children are getting all the books that they require. But my experience has been slightly different um, and that's unfortunate because, you know, I've got elementary, middle school and high schoolers. And what I've heard is the case and, and you can clarify this, but there's there's a class set and then um, if there's you know more kids floating through um uh you know i'm not sure that that class set covers what's necessary and i've seen it firsthand where i've actually had to escalate rather um uh, you know quickly to get um, um a math book for my son uh, which should have just been a simple request. They should have actually been handed out. Uh, but when I when I finally talked to the teacher, uh, she said that they have a limited amount and they literally don't have enough for everyone. So that's my concern. And perhaps there needs to be a refresh uh, budget of some sort. And and I know you have a centralized textbook and supply budget. So I'm 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 concerned that something's missing somewhere um, because the stories that you're hearing tonight. They vary, uh, and that's unfortunate. I just want to say, Mr. Kuhn, I, I appreciate your point on that because uh, my team and I do stand ready to support. Um, and as we find and, and learn of individual cases where a school needs support, uh, we're happy to, to reach out and help. And, and I certainly um, appreciate your point because the goal ultimately is to ensure that students have what they need, right? Rather that's a hard copy or a digital copy. And, and sometimes that may mean that we need to move inventory from one location to another to make sure that those um, resources are where they need to be deployed in the in the, the, the most adaptive manner for the needs each year. So um, I, I do appreciate your point. Thanks. Thank As you know, I will support buying more books. <laughs> yes, I know. We love we love books. <laughs> books. We love books. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, next up, look, looks like we have a question from Ms. Rowe. Yes, I would like to know, do we have courses um, where there's the materials entirely digital and that like only the teacher or has a book or a couple books? Because it, it does seem to me like I'm hearing from the community quite a bit and I've heard this from my own kids a couple times where there's a book, but they don't have it. But the teacher's putting material from the book online or something, and the lack of the book creates some kind of a confusion. And so what I want to know is, are there courses for which most of the material is digital? A book exists, but the kids don't have it. Um, Ms. Rowe, I think you, you asked a great question and I think it, it varies and we do have courses that the primary resources are digital. I'm going to ask Ms. Shea to join us on that conversation as, as she's a little bit closer to each of the different disciplinary area, areas uh, in her day, to, day in and day out work. So Ms. Shea, if you can share, sure. share any detail. Thank you, Thank Dr. McComas. So um, yes, uh, to your question, Ms. Rowe, we do have some courses um, and, and what I will share is that most likely reflects that the adoption of that curriculum or that resource um, took place during a time period where the philosophy around uh, procurement and the policy and rule and, and purchasing reflected that, that philosophy of digital resources. That is not the approach that we've taken for probably close to five years now. So it may reflect a difference in when that course uh, resource was first um, 
develop. So uh, for example, we've had um, secondary math courses where uh, the adoption is now several years old. We're currently in a process of looking for new materials um, when those resources may have been uh, purchased many years ago. It's possible that the resource that was selected was digital only um, in the purchase, so that that may be true. Um, it is not true for any uh, new curriculum purchases or those currently identified as core resources. We take the approach that Dr. McComas described. Um, and to Mr. Kuhn's point, that approach is a blend, which is reflected in the um, policy and rule language Ms. Pester brought forward recently um, to ensure that every student has what he, she, or they need to access curriculum in that manner. So um, both are true, that there are some courses um, that were adopted in that way. But we still so strive to make motion, sure. I'm sorry. Would this motion not provide books for those courses that exist that have only digital materials for which we need books? Well, so in some cases that um, procuring those resources might require a change in contracts. So it would be difficult for me to speak in generalizations. In some cases, those materials might exist but are no longer in print and it wouldn't be possible. In some cases, it would be. Um, but to Dr. McComas's point, I do not have any requests that have come to me where someone has asked me to purchase a book for a student that exists that have not been fulfilled. So if those requests exist, we just need to be made aware of them because as Dr. McComas shared, that is very clearly her direction to our teams. Um, but in terms of would I be able after this motion to now go back and retrofit, I can't speak to that without knowing all the details and all of the um, specific contracts that would align with that. Do we have such a thing as math textbooks that actually explain how to do the math? <laughs> yes, our new Bridges series is fantastic. We have Bridges workbooks and lots of resources. And, and we are actually I've in the yet process. to see a math textbook from <laughs> any of my kids. Yes, yeah, so we are also, as I mentioned, um, based on the Hopkins audit, you know we started with our elementary school, but we are working our way through. We are in the 6002 process right now reviewing uh, multiple series. I can't go into too much detail while it's an open process, but we are seeking to have resources that do a phenomenal job and are highly rated um, through ed reports and other uh, secondary sources. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Next looks like we have, some, we have um, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just asking clarification around what the principals are obligated to pay out of their schoolhouse budget uh, versus what comes from the central office. So I've been listening to the discussion, but it still isn't uh, clear how much the principals um, have to <clears throat> use their, uh, you know, what has been a much smaller schoolhouse budget uh, to purchase these textbooks. So I think again, Ms. Causey, what I would say is um, the expectation is that they replenish textbooks that are not returned. So again, if a textbook gets destroyed, you know, maybe a student, I don't know, it got left out in the rain and the textbook got destroyed, the principal would replace uh, that textbook. And again, if the principal did not have the resources to do that, they could reach out to me and Ms. Shea and we would certainly fill that uh, you know, request for them. So it it's not, I would say, Ms. Causey, I can't give you an exact amount of money because the the it's sort of like a working relationship. The understanding is that they try to replenish those that need to be replenished just based on normal wear and tear uh, year upon year, where my office does uh, expansion for enrollment growth. We do initial purchase. And again, we support any request that comes into the office. If a principal says, you know, I, I need 10 more of these, I just don't have it in my budget, or can you help me with it? We always say yes, so. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, looks like Ms. Hen, you had a comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a comment and a question. So I'm looking at page 127 that has a table of um, budgeted amounts per pupil allocations, and it talks about the textbook fund, and perhaps Dr. McComas could explain how this is operationalized with the school's allocations for textbooks and is that housed at central office or how does that work is this it says that the textbook fund is set aside to provide a central account 
for system wide curriculum changes. Could you explain for us how that works? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to and certainly I would invite Mr. Saris or uh, Mr. Tantliff if there is any additional information when I'm done. Um, and so essentially in uh, the division budget, there is a central textbook budget um, and from that budget, I can um, utilize that to purchase large. Um, uh, sorry, I'm losing my words. I'm getting tired. Um, new <laughs> sets of books. So <laughs> forgive me. Um, Bridges comes to mind. Open Court comes to mind. Um, you know, again, Ms. Shea shared that we are in the process of working through 6002 to identify um, highly rated resources for advanced math classes. So that would be the bucket of money, if you will, Miss Hen and members of the board that I would use to do that initial purchase for a whole new uh, textbook program or a whole new program that we're implementing. Um, I'm not if, sure if I can add to that. Yeah, if I could yes. add to that, McComas, that's also Please. where when Dr. McComas referenced enrollment growth, um, so each summer, even for not new adoptions, but previous adoptions, when schools experience enrollment growth, so they used to have three third grades, but now they're going to have four third grades, we would purchase them an additional, even uh, open court, or even in some cases, wonders material. So it's not always just new adoptions, but also enrollment growth, and then also um, consumables, so replenishment of consumables. So uh, this year that included things like the open court consumables for prior grade levels, as well as um, the number corner and bridges workbooks in the elementary grades. Um, and in some cases, it also supplements uh, novels. So when we come to the board curriculum committee and we get approval to um, disrupt text and to bring in more culturally responsive novels, if we identify a novel selection that will be universally written into the curriculum, then that would be purchased for all schools as well. In some cases, schools use their own um, budget. If, for example, a teacher has a different novel they want to supplement or add to it from that approved list, that can sometimes happen. But if there's one that is written in as the core work in the unit, that would also be purchased from the central textbook fund that Dr. McComas described. OK, thank you for that. So it looks thank like we've um, discussed oh, this motion, I, so I think I'll, that it's time to bring Scott, it to a, a vote. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Follow up comment based on that information so that Mr. Well, it's getting quite late, so I, I, I think I, we have exhausted our discussion of the motion and we still have quite a few members that we do need to get to. So um, if you I'll could quickly. I have other motions I need to make as well. I'll be brief. Um, to Please. Mr. Offerman's question about num having numbers to associate with this, that was on page 127. The per pupil allocation for textbooks is flat based on um, last year's to this year's. So my motion proposes um, increasing that. I don't know what would be required to make sure that books are fully replenished. Um, that I would rely on staff to provide a number um, for that, but that puts us in the ballpark of what the current per pupil allocations are um, to give Mr. Offerman some idea. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so if we could do a roll call vote for this motion, please, so that we could um, continue to move along. Ms. Gover, could you take the vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Uh, no. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasteur? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five. Opposed is six. Okay. Okay, so it looks like the motion fails. Um, Ms. Hen, did you have additional questions or motions? Yes, thank you. I move to amend the FY22 proposed budget by reallocating funds to increase the per pupil allocation to schools as follows. Elementary $110, middle $117, high $142, special $376. And the cost of this motion is $3.2 million. And if you could please put that in the chat. I will do so. Um, 
Now the motion was made. Was there a second? Second row. No. I think someone else said something. I've been having a hard time hearing, but I heard the second from. Um, from Ms. Rowe, so it has been moved that. Um, it has been moved by Ms. Rowe <clears throat> and seconded, I'm sorry, by Ms. Um, excuse me, has been moved by Ms. Hen and seconded by Ms. Rowe to amend the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget by reallocating funds to increase the per pupil allocation to schools as follows. Elementary, uh, 110 thousand middle 117,000 high, high school. Those are dollars per student, Madam Chair. OK, Ele so then let me risk it that elementary one hundred and ten dollars, middle one hundred and seventeen dollars, high school one hundred forty two dollars and special is that education three hundred seventy six dollars. Yes, Madam Chair, and the cost of my motion is three point two million and this represents roughly a 30 percent increase. And okay, I, yes, so Ms. Hen. Okay, yep. Yeah, so I was just going to ask you to speak to your motion, please. I'd like to call the question. Okay, um, but I think I interrupted you. Were you speaking to your motion? No, I just called the question. Thank you. Okay, so the question has been called. Is there a second? Second row. Um, who did the second? I, I, sorry. Row. Point of clarification, Ms. Scott, can a person, and maybe Mr. Mercedes can answer, can you make a motion and then immediately move the question so there's no time for debate and get clarification? Does that have to be done by another board member? Mr. Mercedes, if you could speak to that, please. I will have to look that up. <laughs> Perhaps Ms. Howie knows. Perhaps Ms. Howie knows that one off the top of her head. Oh, Ms. Howie, are you on the call with us? Yes, I'm here, uh, members of the board. There is no prohibition on who can move the previous question. OK, so the question was moved by Ms. Hen and it was seconded by, I couldn't quite hear because it sounded quiet. Um, I believe it was Ms. Rowe. Yes. OK, thank you for that. OK, so then um, we can take a vote on the moving of the question, which basically ends debate. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Mr. McMillian? Favor is five. Opposed is five. And one absent. Miss 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 uh, Miss Gober. Oh. Yes, I vote yes, yes for that. I vote yes for that. So favor is six. Opposed is five. Okay, and so to move the question, it takes two thirds. Correct. Correct. Okay. So um, considering it's 11, then um, then the motion um, to move, it passes. Want to just no, confirm? Fail. No. Sorry, I can't hear. Yeah. It fails. Yeah. OK. It failed. OK, so the motion fails, so then we can continue with debate. So it looks like there was a question or a comment from Ms. Mack. Um, yes, I fully support this. This was an issue that I have brought up every year um, in the budget cycle. I don't know that the people are aware that back in FY14, um, the elementary school per pupil allocation was $142. For middle schools, it was $157. And for high schools, it was $186. And FY19, the elementary 142 dropped to 81. The middle schools 
157 dropped to 86. In high schools, 186 dropped to 107. I believe there was a slight increase in the two years that I've been on the board, but these are decreases um, greater than 40%. Can, I, can you hear me? You sound a little muffled, Miss Matt. We, we were having some trouble. I, I don't know why. I, I didn't do anything. Um, did you That's hear better. That? Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you okay. now. That sounds yes, better. Thank you. you. I'm sorry. I don't know what the problem is. Um, anyway, the, my last comment was schoolhouse budgets per pupil allocations have been cut by greater than 40%, even with the slight increase that occurred. And every uh, principal I've spoken to, every teacher has talked about how impactful that is to them. So I support this motion. Thank you for that, Ms. Mack. Next, we have Dr. Hager. Um, yes, I believe I support the motion as well. I just had a few clarifying questions. Um, first of all, for, for Ms. Hen, you are suggesting to increase it to these amounts or by these amounts. And um, maybe Ms. Hen or, or a staff member, if you could tell me what they are currently in the budget listed as. Yes, Madam Chair, may I address Dr. Hager's question? Yes, please. Thank you. So I put the current allocations in the chat, but elementary is 83, middle is 89, high 110, and special 289. And it's give or take 30%. Great. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. And it's increasing them to the amounts that are in the motion. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next, we have Mr. Offerman. Uh, yes, I guess uh, Ms. Han, just from the wording, uh, uh, proposed budget by by excuse me by reallocating. Uh, where are we where are we reallocating from? Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes, please do. Um, Mr. Offerman, that would be up to the superintendent. I'm not specifying in my motion. Thank you. Okay, next we have Ms. Jose. Ms. Jose? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, he answered, he, had, he kind of asked one of my questions, where are you proposing to reallocate it from? And um, I would like to hear Dr. Williams' take on this because uh, the motion in theory makes sense. We should spend more, but what are we spending more on? Is What is, it, what is that going to go towards when you just bumping it up is that towards instruction is that curriculum what is that bumping up overall going to and if maybe staff could explain that or dr williams thank you so mr saris i'm gonna ask you to explain this is the uh per pupil allocation and increase for each level including special um it would be going directly to support instructional programs, um, but I just want you to clarify that. Yes, these would be uh, at the discretion of the principal um, and could be used for almost anything except uh, an FTE position. Um, the reason the budget uh, has decreased is because schools no longer have the responsibility to pay for uh, copy and printing uh, and technology. So um, beyond that, there's no specificity as to where these dollars would be spent. So it, it could not be a full-time position, but the principal could have her discretion spend it for everything and you're telling me the printing costs are not included was that typically included prior to this well prior to the the double digit reductions yes they paid their own copier leases and maintenance uh, copier leases and printers and they purchased their own technology and so uh, when we we centralized those to uh, support pros, uh, expenses, uh, we did reduce the school budgets and 
but there's but these are completely discretionary. Uh, but this free. does not include our devices that we give out and all of the software and all of the instructional uh, software that we purchase. That is again not included in this cost, which is an extra right. cost that we do incur. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. So next we have Ms. Causey. So my question is related to technology. Um, having been on the board since um, July of 2015, I've seen a number of initiatives uh, come through and, and also um, how they are paid for uh, and, and the allocations going down in the schoolhouse. So at one point, projectors were um, supposedly being paid for by the central office, but then there was a change in direction and um, projectors uh, were being <coughs> required to come out of the schoolhouse budget. Are there additional technologies to that that do come out of the schoolhouse budget? Well, uh, projectors are still maintained by the Department of Technology. Uh, schools do elect to purchase technology on their own if they so choose, um, but uh, we have been spending approximately a million dollars a year centrally on uh, audiovisual support. Uh, there's no other technology uh, that is specifically required of the schools. Uh, okay. Thank you for that, um, Ms. Causey. It looks next like we have Ms. Rowe. Yes, yeah, so I remember when we started reducing schoolhouse budgets, and I remember that the justification for doing so was this copy and print thing, but it was also because of the idea that we were going to make all of our curriculum digital. But I just heard Ms. Shea say that schoolhouses have to pay for the replacement books. So it seems to me that if from six years ago to now, we're now purchasing textbooks that we weren't purchasing then when we reduced the money, that schoolhouses are going to need this money to purchase replacement books. So I think we should give it to them. Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. Um, all right, so um, Ms. Gober, are we ready to take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Coffey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jeff? Ms. Joe? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Hester? Yes. Mr. Q? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors 10, absent 1. <laughs> okay, so it looks like the motion carries. All right, um, moving on. Ms. Hen, did, was there anything else or we can we move to the next board member? Madam Chair, I have um, two additional motions, but we can move on and um, reserve the rest of my time and we can come back to me. Um, no, that's fine. If you have your two motions, you can go ahead and make those. We, we can return back. I'd like to hear what other board members propose. Thank you. OK, all right, so we can go around. Uh, Mr. Offerman. Yes, uh, on 114 of the, uh, of the most recent budget book, the projected class sizes are listed and broken up by K to two, three to five, middle and high. I was wondering if how, how these numbers compare to the to the uh, to the past years, if someone can answer that, thank you. Uh, sure, Th those uh, numbers, the uh, ratios have stayed consistent for uh, seven years or so now, seven or eight years. 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alferman. Next, it looks like we have Ms. Pastor. No motions, no, no motions. questions concerning the budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Pastor. Next, we have Mr. Kuhn. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, I, I have a few questions. All right. On page um, 249, actually, I'll start on page 248. Um, under instructional salaries and wages, there is 2.5 million under educational options. Um, what is educational options and what is included in this category? So I can I can get a start and perhaps uh, Mr. Saris, if you can you can assist um, or Ms. Frock. So educational options, uh, Mr. Kuhn, if, again, if um, anyone who's controlling the slides, if you want to go back to the fourth slide, I believe it was, uh, is a department within the Division of Curriculum Instruction. Right there, thank you. <laughs> uh, so Mr. King, if you look on the left side of the slide, you'll see Department of Educational Options. And these are the programs that um, are uh, fall within that department. So our magnet programs, our extended day, our extended year programs, e-learning, uh, and so on. And so they're all the offices and the services that are provided within that department. Um, in terms of everything that's rolled up in that um, budget number there, I'm not sure if Mr. Saris um, is able to speak to that or I can uh, ask Ms. Frock if she could um, help me with all the things that are showing that one budget um, spot. Yeah, this is uh, George Saris. The, uh, the largest amount for salary and wages are for uh, instructional uh personnel uh we have uh staff that teach home and hospital we have um staff that teach alternative educational programs um we have uh extended year learning uh in the summer um uh, and so all of those uh instructional salaries go to those teachers. OK, so. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, uh, Dr. McComb is just focusing on the educational technology piece. Um, does that include all digital resources? It, it includes the, the things that are primarily um, uh, productivity tools. It's sort of, um, and, and Mr. Corns may need to join me for this. So there are certain resources that are purchased through Department of uh, Information Technology. So for example, Microsoft um, suite is purchased through DOIT. Um, digital safety, technology, and library media, what you will find in there is all of the digital subscriptions that come as part of our library media program. You will find a lot of um, digital resources that, um, for example, BrainPop, um, some of the Wixi programs that are um, tools. So there's content, there's tools um, and resources. You would find uh, discovery streaming um, as part of our um, digital library resources. So it's a, it, that's really what you're going to find in that area. I don't want to ramble, but I think I, <laughs> <Okay. All right. laughs> sorry. I, I, so, so from what I hear, it seems to cover a significant portion of our digital footprint through that group. I would say so, but we also have um, some resources that are covered in the content offices as well. So if it's um, uh, like, for example, we have um, a discovery tech book that um, is a science resource and that's covered in our science um, budget. Oh, all right. So 
So depending upon what type of digital resource depends kind of where does it appropriately live? Do any digital resources live in textbooks and instructional materials? Those line items? So, yeah. Yes. Um, there are um, resources that are digital that live in, in those. Uh, again, for example, remember I was describing earlier, if you uh, typically purchase a, a set of hard books, you get the subscription that goes with it. Uh, when that subscription has come due, that is then absorbed um, in the instructional, uh, in the department of academics, if you will, or in the textbook account. Okay, so just so we're clear, um, textbooks can mean digital and print always. Fundamentally, because that's how the marketplace is moving uh, nowadays. Um, if it is just a straight subscription, it is not in the textbook. So in order for it to be in the textbook account, it has to have a hard uh, textbook um, aspect to it. OK. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm still on page 248 and <clears throat> um, I'm seeing and I'm guessing some money has moved around. Uh, I'm just trying to understand it because I'm looking at uh, FY20 actual uh, through FY21 budget and 22 proposed and I'm seeing uh, you know it going from 15.9 million uh, but it looks like under the chief academic officer under instructional textbooks and supplies went from seven million dollars to, to two million dollars proposed that seems like a significant change can someone just explain that like the main area that that money has changed or where it moved to yeah the primary uh reason for that change is that um, in years, uh, for many years, county government has funded many of our large scale textbook rollout uh, programs as one time expenses. And that is really no longer feasible under most MSDE uh, rules and regulations. And so, um, in years where we don't have a way of funding a large scale textbook rollout, we typically do it over multiple years and um, and that is the general reason for that change. All right, so there was some form of an accounting change that we have to follow because um, the Maryland Maryland has, has changed the accounting rules somehow. Is that is that uh, correct, Mr. Sarris? Well, it's really uh, well. Yes, uh, we're no because MSDE now has determined that uh, when we, ch for example, when we changed uh, our curriculum to align with college and career standards in 2014, uh, it was acknowledged that virtually all of our textbooks would have to be replaced to achieve alignment. And so over those years, we received one time funding. Um, we're at the point now we're having made that transition. Uh, MSTE believes correctly that uh, when you buy a textbook, it will have to be replaced. And so it would be inappropriate to call it a one time purchase. OK, so just so I'm clear, where would all the ongoing purchases of textbooks fall? If I'm looking at this book, where would they go? Right, so if you look at the bottom of page 13, uh, it was referenced previously about the textbook fund, and that's where we referenced the $3 million fund uh, that's allocated each year. We have a fund for textbooks, a fund for library books, and a fund for musical instruments. Um, and then we request uh, additional funding uh, for these uh, for textbook rollouts, um, but we're just not allowed to 
categorize it as a one time item. OK, I see where it says ongoing revolving funds, but in your actual budget, does that fall under curriculum and C&I yeah. and or some textbook line item? Yeah, it falls under the, the chief academic officer's budget, I believe. Um, let me see where that is, unless Dr. Boswell McComas has memorized her page number. Um, I have not done that, uh, Mr. Sears, but I think I, think I can right, help so that, out, gentlemen. That's on uh, page 252. Thank you. And that would always be under supplies and material then? Uh, well, it's actually, it, it yes, it's in, it's instructional supplies and materials, yes. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. And I will stop asking questions for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Looks next like we have Dr. Hager. Home stretch here. Um, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, <laughs> I I sent some uh, questions on Friday, and I know that was very late. Um, and so I I fully understand um, that you all need to spend some time with those questions. Um, and I I believe we still have one more opportunity to make motions about the budget next week. Is that correct, Ms. Scott? Or not? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, I believe yes. that is correct. Yes. Okay, um, just in that case, um, you know, we, we certainly don't need to discuss those specific questions. Um, I did have a question that arose during the meeting and that had to do with the non non public private schools and the amount of funding that goes to those types of schools. And this is just kind of a big, quick, big picture question that we don't need to get in the, into the weeds about. But um, have we taken the time to do a really thorough cost analysis to see if this is the most effective approach? to using our budget dollars and whether it would be better to invest in improving our existing programs for these children so that we don't need to pay external schools to support them? So I, I will begin and I, again, I don't know if my colleague, Mr. Saris has anything to add. So uh, Dr. Hager, that's a great question. And we have um, over the years uh, brought forward proposals at different points to try to stand up, if you will, some comparable um, regional programs at first to begin programming so that we're, we're offering some of the services that perhaps these non-public uh, settings are offering that we currently are not able to offer uh, to try to meet that need. Um, the challenge often is um, in requesting a new initiative at making it all the way through the budget process to include our, uh, you know, us as a community of, of the school system, along with the CE and the county council and everything. So we have um, not been successful in, in standing up some of those programs to begin really seeing how might we be able to retain students as opposed to students hitting a certain threshold where we're not able to service them and then they seek service in a, in a more uh, comprehensive clinical setting. So. And uh, Dr. Wiss said you, you were in that uh, position over special ed at that time. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add. We have not uh, brought that forward this year, just anticipating a rather austere budget uh, situation. So we were trying to be um, reasonable um, and realistic about what to ask for. So thank you. Um, Kind of in line with that, and, and um, this is something we can certainly talk about later offline or at another meeting, perhaps might be a better place. Um, but is is that something that these grant funding, funding dollars that we may get this year could go to support a pilot program like that to determine whether next year's budget is worth a bigger investment? Does that make sense? I, yes, I, I understand. I, I think the um, the challenge is always when you're using grant funds for whatever purpose is what happens when you get to the sunset of the grant and the cliff, right? Mm -hmm. And for that, especially for some um, really um, high needs, you know, it's one thing to use grant funds for supplemental resources is another thing to use them for uh, really fundamental resources that we could not uh, tolerate a cliff on, if you will. Okay. So, but I appreciate your point on, on considering that. Yeah, and I, I may circle back to that point because it is a huge part of our budget and 
you know, we're paying other schools to take care of our kids. And so I think it would be wonderful if we could meet the needs um, on our own. So, um, so again, this is something I'll probably be thinking about a lot over the next year. So I appreciate those, those answers. So I'm finished. Absolutely. Okay, could, thank you. Could I add briefly? Oh, uh, yes, who's speaking? Yeah, this is George Saris. I just wanted to uh, follow up to Dr. Boswell McComas by uh, indicating that the time when we've looked at the the relative cost between non-public and public placements, um, there's it's not uh, the benefit is not so much on a per pupil basis, but really providing an opportunity for students to remain close to home without lengthy uh, transportation trips and so forth. Um, so I, I think if, if that decision, that factor would be important to consider. Um, also, I would mention that many parents, based on the discussions we've had about parent reimbursements for private placements really do seem to prefer and demand some of these placements. Um, so you won't please all everybody in either case. Um, and I also did want to mention, Dr. Hager, that we did have time to look at the three questions that you presented, and, and I can give you some uh, succinct answers if that's something that you do want to raise this evening. Um, so that uh, I just, with an eye towards the 23rd, we have only a handful of days thereafter to put the document together. So uh, your three questions related um, to the 122.3 positions that uh, we would re have removed for lost enrollment. And uh, so the amount to add those back is 6.9 million without benefits and 9.65 million with benefits. And um, uh, to your second question, uh, you mentioned the 250 e FTEs to improve staffing ratios in classrooms. And we think that that is a pretty good estimate. Uh, the cost would be about 18 point six five million dollars and that uh, would be roughly equivalent adjusting for enrollment growth to the positions that Mr. Tantliff indicated we removed about eight years ago. Um, and to your last question uh, about special education staffing, uh, we have not reduced special education staffing as a result of lost enrollment and the current budget is based on this on the enrollment that we project for next year so we don't uh we can we can maintain our current staffing levels more or less uh, without adding any additional special ed teachers so nothing's being been taken away this year or next. So for that last question, um, in the the first version of the budget book, um, it said that there were no additional special education positions funded in the proposed budget. Um, and elsewhere it said the five-year growth rates for FY 2020 of 16.9% for students was much faster than overall student growth. So with, with that growth trajectory of students, right. it surprises me that you wouldn't need more teachers. Well, so for example, this year we lost 4,000 enrollment. We did not, yeah. that did not. I think they're coming back, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. And, and so our current, the 22 budget is proposed, uh, is based on 116,600 students. And we think we'll probably come in less than that. So we haven't adjusted special ed staffing based on these fluctuations. If we want to improve the overall staffing ratios, then we would need to add positions. OK, um, thank you so much for doing that so quickly. I forgot there was a holiday yesterday, too. I sent it on Friday, so I really appreciate that. Um, so 
Uh, if it is okay then, Ms. Scott, to make a motion this late at night, um, I would like to do so, if that's okay. Yes, you may make a motion. Um, if you could make sure you put it in the chat so I can restate it properly, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, let's put it in right now. So, oh, okay, sure. Is that highlighted weirdly in yellow for you guys? Um, okay, so I move to hire additional classroom teaching positions to reduce the teacher student ratios by one student per classroom for fiscal year 2022 without offsetting reductions in in-school positions of any kind. And so we just turn. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Okay, so I, I calculated it out to be, oh, I'm sorry, may I speak to that, Ms. Scott? Yes, Ms. Hayes. Can you, Dr. Re Hayes, can you read it in the chat or did it come out um, really weird? Actually, um, before you speak to it, if you could repost it, because I cannot read that so I can restate I, it so you can that's speak so to it. so weird. I just copied and pasted it and it came out really, Oh, I did it again. That's so. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Um, I will figure that out. I may need to email it to I, you. I apologize. So I, um, um, I can, I believe I can um, see it enough. So let's see if I. Oh, there we go. If I highlight it, I can um, okay. see it. So. Okay. Oh, looks like it's in there now. Let's restate it. OK, there we go. So I will um, receive the motion so that we can um, uh, have debate. It has been moved and seconded to hire uh, additional classroom teaching positions to reduce teacher student ratios by one student per classroom for fiscal year 2022 without offsetting via reductions in in school positions of any kind. The motion was made by Dr. Hager and seconded by I believe that was Miss Mack. Yes, thank you. Yeah, oh. and, and may, may I speak and, to uh, it? Dr. Hager, if you could speak to your motion, please. Thank you. Um, sure. So I um, I read through the budget book and, and read about the different uh, ratios that uh, Mr. Offerman also asked about earlier today, and we know that um, that the way that they're calculated, um, it's not always the, the case in every school that those ratios are, are kept. Uh, true across the board, and so just bringing more more individuals into the classroom, or in, I'm sorry, into the school building will, without question, reduce ratios to some extent and start to make a dent in into our large class sizes. And so, uh, based on my calculations, this would include hiring 250 classroom teachers. And Mr. Sarah said I did a good job with my math, um, which would be 90 in elementary school, 75 in middle, and 80 in high school. And then, as we heard, it would cost 18.65 million dollars. Thank you for that, Dr. Hager. And it looks like we have a question from Ms. Rowe. Yes, so by teaching positions, did you mean um, classroom teachers or special education additional assistants or reading specialists or any or all or any combination of the above? Um, I, I wrote classroom teaching positions, meaning classroom teachers, um, and that was that was the intention. I apologize if it's not clear. OK, so is the intention then to have some classrooms where there's two teachers or because I guess where's the physical facility space going to come from or does this not necessitate more physical facility space? I think it would be up to the administrator to decide how to implement the classroom teachers. OK, thank you. OK, next we have Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also had a question for Dr. Hager. Um, the motion states um, that this is to be implemented without offsetting via reductions in in-school positions of any kind, which I support and I, I support this motion. Um, are you expecting that this would be implemented via um, reallocation within the current budget? Um, potentially, and this is really why I did the analysis, or analysis of the current uh, salary and wages sections of each of the sections of the budget book, um, because the superintendent's budget over five years increased by just the salaries and wages, so not the other parts of the of the um, budget, but the salaries and wages increased by 18.7% over five years. Um, in the curriculum and instruction budget, it increased, oh, I'm sorry, these are the wrong numbers. The superintendent's was 23%, curriculum and instruction was about 30 percent um, and then business services was about 26 percent and schools was only 13 percent. So 
Um, all in all, those changes, th those increases we saw over five years equal about $50 million. And this budget item will cost about $18.65 million. So, um, so it, you know, it's not up to us how to decide how it is reallocated, but, um, but it feels like salaries and wages could go to salaries and wages. But again, that would be up to the superintendent. Thank you. And would you be open to an amendment that states that it is to be implemented through reallocation? Yes. Okay. I move to amend the motion on the floor um, to add by reallocating the current um, proposed budget. Okay, you'll have to put that in, um, I will put uh, it in the chat, but adding it where? I'll, I'll put my proposed amendment in the chat so that it can be read. Okay, but but um, you have to clarify where it's being added. So it's I, I understand you're adding it to her motion, but where in her motion are you um, proposing that it, that it be added? Without offsetting the reductions in in-school positions of any kind through reallocation. Just those two words at the end. Can okay, I accept so it as a friendly amendment or whatever? Or does it need to be voted on? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm still not seeing you have. Um, so, well, if the amendment was proposed and then it, um, it would need a second, but again, I'm, I'm still not clear. You're saying it's two words that you want to add to the end of her motion? Yes, it's now in the chat. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, the amendment was made by Ms. Hen. Um, is there a second? Second, Matt. Okay. So I'll state the amendment. It says, I move to hire additional classroom teaching positions to reduce teacher-student ratios by one student per classroom for fiscal year 2022 without offsetting via reductions in in-school positions of any kind through reallocation. Okay, so the amendment was made by Ms. Hen, seconded by Ms. Mack. So now we need to process the amendment. Um, Ms. Govert, could we take a roll call vote, please? Madam okay. Chair, this is this is a debatable motion to amend. I'm sorry, thank you, Mr. Mercedes. I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, this is debatable. So if the board members wish to debate this amendment, that can happen. If oh, okay. If they don't, then it can go right to the vote. Okay, thank you for um, bringing that up. So um, is there any discussion? M Madam yeah. Chair, this is... This is Dr. Scriven. Could could we add a little clarity to this motion, please? Okay. To the amendment. Because we're to we're the amendment. Debating the amendment. Um yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Saris. Uh yes, thank you, Madam Chair and Dr. Scriven. Just wanted to point out because I'm not aware that administrative salaries have increased any any differently than instructional salaries. I'm referencing pages 342 um, in the uh, appendix and uh, page um, 346 in the appendix, um, which is the summary of administrative and instructional salaries. Uh, in or as the board has noted this evening, uh, there have been dramatic cuts in various offices, and that was to achieve uh, a four and a half million dollar reduction in expenses to provide a cola um, to reduce expenses by almost nineteen million dollars is going to have dramatic impacts really throughout the budget um, and maybe some unintended uh, and we're certainly happy to spend the next two weeks developing 
some possible uh, responses, um, but that's going to be very difficult to achieve through reallocations. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows they're likely to be offsetting uh, reductions that may be uh, distasteful or untenable. Thank you for that, Mr. Sears. Is there any other debate? I have one question, Ms. Scott. This is Lily Rowe. I can barely hear. Um, could you say oh, that again? I'm sorry. I have a question. So um, just to clarify for the sake of the amendment, um, if we fulfill these positions through reallocation, that means it comes from somewhere else in the budget. And if we don't fulfill it through reallocation, that means the county executive would have to fund it. Is that the impact of the amendment? Um, and I guess that would be a question for staff. Yeah, Mr. Saris, George. Yes, that that is essentially correct. There would have to be um, a, a revenue source uh, aligned with that expense. So, how much would that many positions cost? Well, I think we eighteen point seven million is the figure in Dr. Hager's motion. Okay. Um, if I could, it was we're we're discussing the amendment, so it was Miss Hen's amendment to Dr. Hager's motion. So then that would probably be a question for Miss Hen. Well, it it matters whether we're reallocating. I mean, my understanding of the amendment is that if we say that we're going to reallocate this money, it means that the money's got to come from somewhere else already in whatever budget gets approved. If we go with the original amendment, my understanding is we're saying that the county executive would have to fund it as additional funding. OK, so yeah, we're discussing the amendment. So Ms. Hen, do you have a response to Ms. Um, it matters Rose's how question? much. Yeah, do you, so do you have a response to Ms. Um, Rose's question, Ms. Hen? Ms. Rose's understanding is correct. I can't speak to the amount. That's OK. OK, yeah, no, I was asking because it was your amendment, so that's why I wanted to give you the opportunity to, the to respond. The reallocation means we would have to um, have a revenue source from, from somewhere else. OK. All right, um, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. Thank you. So my question to follow up with Mr. Saris is um, my understanding in 2010 in a recession, there was a reduction of 200 teachers. And my understanding from remarks from TABCO through the years is that those 200 FTEs uh, were never added back uh, to the school system. So I'm just wondering if that's uh, an accurate portrayal or if you could clarify um, that situation please no that is absolutely correct okay all right thank you thank you okay and i just again we are discussing the amendment so i want to make sure that we're staying on task because we need to process that and then process the motion um dr hager you had a question I oh, know uh, Lily asked my question. So I'm good. All right. Thank you. Ms. Jose, you have a question? Yes. Um, first of all, that's $18 million. Reallocation is not going to, it's going to be a lot of money to reallocate. Uh, that's the simple reason why I would not be supporting that amendment. Secondly, uh, Ms. Howie or Dr. Mr. Mercedes, if you can correct me, we can amend to the second degree. I can amend Ms. Hen's motion before it going to vote. Is that correct? That is correct. There can be okay. a second amendment and no, no more after that. Correct. So this is the last one. So I would like to strike out the word reallocation for Ms. Hen's amendment. OK, um, is there a second? Madam Chair, could I ask for legal advice? Is it possible to amend an amendment by canceling out the First Amendment? Yes, that's called striking. 
I'm sorry, if we could get, I'm sorry, excuse me, if we could get um, legal advice, Mr. Brusades, if you could give us clarification. Yes, it, that can happen. But isn't that the same? It, it essentially okay. withdraws my amendment. That would be the effect, yes, if it passed. Without a vote? No, there'd be a vote on Ms. Jose's amendment, which would have an effect on your amendment. Okay, I think what Ms. Hen was asking, um, and, and again, just for clarification, I guess what Ms. What Ms. Hen was asking was that if her amendment had to be voted on first before a second amendment or anything could be um, stricken from her amendment. No, at this point, Ms. Jose's amendment is on the table for discussion. Okay. Okay. So, um, so Ms. Jose has um, amended has has made a motion to amend <laughs> the amendment, um, which would be basically striking out the word reallocation. And um, is there a second? Second. Second. Passed. Okay. Looks like it was seconded by I think Mr. Offerman got there first. Um, so then, basically. Um, Ms. Jose, could you put that in the chat then on um, what your amendment is so that we, we yes, I can properly I, I speed it? Did. Yes. You just put it in the chat, it, okay. It should be the, the original motion because we just added, or, or Julie added the two words. Yeah. Just to Not make it easier. Correct. And after having heard from Mr. Saris and um, the rest of the staff, it's just not fair to to do this to the budget at the nth hour. So while I support Dr. Hager's motion, uh, I would like to strike the word reallocation from the amendment. Uh, and I guess that motion has to be voted on first. Okay, all right, so it's been moved and seconded. So the amendment um, basically to the, amend the amendment is, and I will just um, restate it, is I move to hire additional classroom teaching positions to reduce teacher student ratios by one student per classroom for fiscal year 2022 without offsetting via reductions in in school positions of any kind. Period. OK. All right, so um, is there any debate? Any Madam questions? Chair, this is Ms. Causey. I would just ask for clarification that the vote is uh, going to be to strike uh, via to strike the word allocation. It's we're not voting on the entire motion. We're just voting on the second amendment. Is that correct? Yes, which is to strike the word. It uh, looks like it's reallocation. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So um, as it is getting late, we have to repeat things. So um, the amendment is um, basically we are voting on the second amendment, which is to strike the word reallocation, which was moved by Ms. Jose and seconded by Mr. Offerman. Uh, Ms. Gover, could we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Clausey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Hester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is five, opposed is six. Okay, so we needed six for it to um, pass, so it looks like the amendment failed. So we have five, them, or rather, yes, the amendment failed. So, um, so that was the, it, the motion was on the amendment. So now, Madam Chair, um, would you please? Yes, was there a Yes, this is Ms. Hen. Would you please confirm the votes with Ms. Gover? Oh, yes, Ms. Gover, could we confirm the votes again, please? So, 
their favor was Ms. Jost, Mr. Offerman, Ms. Pasteur, Dr. Hager, and Ms. Scott. Opposed was Ms. Rowe, Ms. Clausey, Ms. Mack, Mr. McMillian, Ms. Hen, and Mr. Kuhn. So opposed was six. Yes, that's how I, how yeah. I counted it. And Madam Chair, that was a vote on the second amendment. So that brings us now to the first amendment, which was Ms. Hen's amendment, which includes the words through reallocation. Thank you for that clarification. So now we're voting on the first amendment, which is to add the words through reallocation. So if you're in favor of, uh, of adding the words through reallocation, then you would vote in favor. If you're opposed, then you would vote against. So, um, Ms. Gover, if we could take the roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Clausey? Ms. No. Clausey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jost? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. No. My fault. Thank you. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. The favor is three. Okay, so that motion. The amendment failed. Excuse me, I apologize. The amendment um, passes. No, it fails. No, it fails. Oh, excuse me. Favor I'm was sorry. three. Yes. Opposed was eight. Okay. <laughs> and Madam <laughs> Chair, okay. Madam Chair, yeah. that brings us back to the original motion by Ms. Hager. Okay, so now we can vote on the original motion as proposed by Dr. Hager. Can we restate the motion, please? Yes, I can restate the original motion. Okay, um, I move to hire additional classroom teaching positions to reduce teacher student ratios by one student per classroom for fiscal year 2022 without offsetting via reductions in in school positions of any kind. Yes, let's go. OK, are we ready for the vote? Roll call vote. Ms. Gover, if Ms. we could. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Clausey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors 11. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Motion passes. So, um, Dr. Hager, was there additional questions or information? No, I'm finished. And like I said, I, I was going to wait to do that. So, thank you, Mr. Saris, and thank you, everyone, for your patience. So, I'm finished. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And it looks like next on the list is me, Ms. Scott, and um, I would just like to thank staff for all of their hard work and putting this together. I would also um, like to thank all of the board members and everyone for your time, your commitment, and for um, reviewing this and for the robust discussion um, that, that we've had. And um, so that's my input. And it looks like, oh, Ms. Hen, you said you, um, you have a question or a final motion? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, one Sorry, we can't hear you, Ms. Hen. Oh, can you hear me now? A little bit. How about now? That's a little bit better, yeah. 
OK, thank you. Um, I have one final motion, and that is I move to amend the fiscal year 22 proposed budget by reallocating 175,000 to school grants for establishing family engagement programs designed to increase student attendance and improve achievement by increasing family involvement in school programs. Schools would submit plans for such programs and funding is awarded based on proposed program offerings. Second, Matt. Okay, um, Ms. Hannon, could you please put that in the chat so that I may restate? Yes, ma'am, one second. It is in the chat, thank you. Okay, great, let me see. Okay. All right, so Ms. Hen um, made a motion, which was seconded by, I believe um, it has been moved and seconded. It sounds like it was seconded by Ms. Smack. And Ms. Hen moved to amend the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget by reallocating $175,000 to school grants for establishing family engagement programs designed to increase student attendance and improve I'm sorry, uh, designed to increase student attendance and improve achievement by increasing family involvement in school programs. Schools submit plans for such programs and funding is awarded based on proposed program offerings. Okay, um, Ms. Hen, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Yes, ma'am, thank you. So one of the board's goals is increasing family engagement and this budget motion supports that goal. Um, these programs would be um, modeled after the very successful transition grants, which are provided to schools to ensure a smooth transition for students advancing from elementary to middle and students advancing from middle to high, which were um, implemented a few years ago. There, these would be structured as add-on allocations um, as found on page 127 of the budget book. And um, schools would apply for these grants based on proposals to establish family engagement programs. This is a need that we hear about consistently from staff, um, and this would provide the funding in order to establish those programs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hent. Looks like Ms. Jose has a question. Yes, it looks like Dr. McComas is in there. I, my question is, who would be awarding this program? Is it the board would be awarding it? What kind of programs are included? And in, Dr. McComas, I think we have uh, something, if we have something similar in the system, if you could explain what this motion does. Uh, thank you, Ms. Josen. And forgive me, Ms. Hen, I'm not trying to speak for on your behalf, Ms. Hen. I just wanted to share for the benefit of everyone on, on the board so you have a full understanding. We do, through our Title I um, federal grant, provide um, a very similar uh, service um, their school family liaisons and the, and the specific purpose and a requirement of all of our Title I schools is to have uh, school family um, support. And I don't know if um, Dr. Wista, if there's anything else you'd like to add to that, but I just want to make sure that the board was aware there is a, a function of this work in our Title I grant. This is a great um, as aspect of what perhaps grant money is really well used for. Um, <laughs> And I don't know, Dr. Wista, if you have anything to add? Uh, no, you are correct. That um, does happen in our Title I schools. Um, we also, the, in every school, and um, this really is in another office, they have family, um, they have uh, what they call FACE, and I don't even recall what F-A-C-E stands for, but it's some kind of family um, engagement person at, in every building as well. That's, so a, we that's a liaison for each school. Sorry, Ms. Joseph, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, but thank you for the opportunity. I hope that information was helpful for everyone. Yeah, so it looks like we have something in Title I schools. Uh, so my question to Ms. Hens' motion is for FY22. Right now, we can gather in large gatherings. So I don't even know how that would uh, take place in a, a family engagement program, so it, it would be a moot point given that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I will not be supporting this motion. Okay, uh, looks like we have a question from Dr. Hager. Um, well, one question stemming from what Dr. McComas just said, so, and perhaps the question is for Ms. Hen, um, would this only be in Title I schools or are you envisioning this opportunity for all the schools in the system? 
Madam Chair, may I respond to Dr. Hager? Yes, please. Thank you. So the vision is this, this would be open to all schools, and this is clearly a need that's been communicated um, to me by many of our schools, and that this has not been, um, uh, there have been no resources within our schools to provide this. So it would be available to all schools. And to Ms. Joe's comment, um, we're delivering learning virtually. There's no reason that we can't engage our families virtually as well. So hopefully that answers your question, Dr. Hager. Um, it does. I just want to also mention that we have uh, well, this is, this is me wearing my my other hat um, in life, but we have wellness wellness teams in every school that use the WISC model, the whole school, whole child, whole community model. And in the 10 component WISC model, one component is family engagement and one is community involvement. Um, and so I, I'm not sure if I can wrap our, my head around an amendment at this late time uh, at night, but, um, but that is an evidence-based model that's promoted by the CDC and the superintendents and, and everybody in the country um, as a way for improving kind of whole child health and whole child outcomes. Um, and so, um, you know, just throwing that out there as, as a, a mode uh, that's existing for all schools in the system for community or family engagement at this point in time. Um, I do like the idea of funneling money into something like that though, but um, but just mentioning that as, as, a, as a mode for potentially pushing this forward. And I love that idea. And that's exactly the type of um, example that I was envisioning that so that existing programs could benefit from this funding. It wouldn't necessarily have to be in reinventing the wheel, but um, like you said, funneling money, money into programs that are effective and that are working because we know each school community is different and has different needs and different ways of reaching their families. So yes, they would be eligible to benefit from this as well. Madam Chair Scott. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, who's speaking? It's Michael Dickerson, Chief of Staff. I just wanted the board to note that we have an entire Department of Family and Community Engagement that works with uh, not just Title I schools, but all of our schools. And that's the uh, group that Dr. Wissett was speaking on. I would certainly want uh, that department to be involved in any funding that would go through uh, because they have one on one uh, contacts with these schools and those families. Uh, not just through uh, family and community engagement, but also through parent university. Thank you for that, Mr. Dickerson. OK. All right, any other comments or debate? OK. All right, Ms. Gilver, if we could do a roll call vote on um, Ms. I'm Hen's sorry, Ms. motion. Scott, I oh, I'm one. sorry. I did There's a question. question. Ms. Rowe. Yes. yes Ms. Rowe. Um, who would decide who gets the grant money? Um, I don't think we could hear you, Ms. Rowe, I, or it might just be oh, me. Could you who, restate that, please? Who would decide who gets the grant money? So, Madam Chair, I would yes. like to amend my um, motion based on Mr. Dickerson's comment that the grant would be administered by the Office of Family and Community Engagement. OK, so you're um, you um, made an amendment. Unless it doesn't require an amendment, but to answer Ms. Rowe's question, it seems only natural that they would administer the grant. So OK, so then, all right, thank you. That answers my question. OK. All right. Are there any additional questions? OK. All right, I didn't want to leave anyone out. Um, yeah, so Ms. Gilbert, could we do a roll call vote, please? This is for the amendment. Uh, there wasn't a second on the amendment. Um, Ms. Hen, did you make an amendment? No, ma'am. No, okay. Yeah, I didn't think that that there was, but um, thanks for questioning that. It is late, so yeah. <laughs> just want to make sure. Thank you. We're properly processing everything. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Ms. Pasture? 
Yes. Oh, thank you, Ms. Pastor. Mr. Kuhn? No. Mr. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is nine. Opposed is one. Absent is one. Okay. All right, so the motion passes. All right. Um, were there any other comments from board members? If not, we'll move on to the next agenda item. OK, so hearing none, the next item on the agenda is board member comments, and um, I'll start on the other side of the dais and um, we'll start with Dr. Hager. Um, I just want to thank the staff for all their hard work on the budget and, and answering all of our questions and staying with us until this late hour. And that's all I have to say. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Next is Mr. Kuhn. Uh, ditto what Dr. Hager said. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, next is Ms. Pastor. Our comments about the budget, Ms. Scott. Oh, no, we're now doing uh, board member comments. So, okay. Um, whatever you'd like to share. Okay. Um, mine is um, brief. I um, looked at CDC guidelines for uh, people with existing conditions and people who are caretakers of people with existing issues and knowing just how caring our staff members are. I am hoping that when those people who have those existing conditions and who are caretakers where they reside with them of existing conditions that we are case by case um, articulating um, actively with our staff members to make sure that they know just how valuable they are to us as we're making decisions as a system about with documentation from medical um, personnel about their returning to schools for their safety and for the safety of our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, next is Mr. Alferman. I want to thank staff for 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 for, uh, for all they have done, and I all and I want to uh, send my thanks to all the uh, school personnel who have who have worked with us through this long time as we uh, as we attempt to get back to hybrid and uh and and in-person learning thank you thank you mr offerman next is mr mahumza oh, okay all right we'll keep going next is miss hen thank you madam chair i'd also like to thank staff profusely for their efforts um, through this budget cycle um in clearly what has been one of the most difficult cycles yet in producing the budget book um, per our directive and that was clearly um, no small feat so i generally appreciate that i'd also like to thank our stakeholders and public for their engagement um, when i joined the board in 2016 it you know our viewership of meetings was in the single digits and now we probably have thousands of viewers who are engaged or involved in the process <laughs> My dog clearly has a lot to say as well. I apologize, <laughs> uh, but I'd like to thank our community for being so atten attentive and engaged and for all of your feedback. So thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Ms. Hen. <laughs> um, next we have Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. No, OK. Next we have Mr. McMillian. A big thank you to everybody. And good night. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, next, we have Ms. Mack. Yes, about three weeks ago, I was fortunate to have had the opportunity to participate in a virtual high school ELA class. I'd like to give kudos to the teachers, enthusiasm and preparedness, the students' participation, the selection of the novels um, that were used in the assignment and their relevance to societal issues. It was a very enjoyable and enlightening experience, and I really have, I appreciate having had that opportunity. Thank you and good night, everybody. 
Thank you, Ms. Mack. Ms. Colsey? Thank you. Um, I appreciate um, superintendent staff working on the budget. I also appreciate my board colleagues who have also spent a great deal of time evaluating the budget. Um, many of them, not just this year, but in previous years as well. Um, <clears throat> I did want to just take a minute and talk about things that are going on in the school system from the board's perspective. Um, Black History Month is very important that's going on. And while we're not together, there are virtual events that are happening. Tabco ESPBC put on a Black Lives Matter at School Student Forum and Community Engagement. Um, I was happy to attend that for the second year. Um, <clears throat> last year was in person and this year was virtual. They did a wonderful job uh, putting that on and there was just a lot of uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, the other thing, a COVID pandemic victim is the National School Board Association Conference, uh, but they did put on their National School Board Association Cube Equity Forum that was last week. Um, and that's going to be available. And there was a lot of uh, wonderful insight there. Um, <clears throat> uh, the other thing is, um, I just wanted to say that um, we received an email from TABCO president, Ms. Cindy Sexton, and she says, as you well know, there are many unanswered questions and concerns around the reopening of schools. The concerns we are hearing about the most revolve around availability and accessibility of vaccines, options for educations to remain virtual or return to schools, concerns about leaves and accommodations the updated, and the updated CDC guidance. Pursuant to BCPS policy 8311, TABCO is respectfully requesting a special meeting of the board to be called to focus solely on concerns around reopening. Um, and she goes on to uh, quote more things that they have received hundreds of questions um, <clears throat> by educators that have not been answered, and she would like that opportunity to have that discussed. So I'm going to make a motion that the board call a um, special meeting um, ahead of the budget meeting <clears throat> to focus solely on the reopening of schools. We have teachers that are supposed to report next week that are still having concerns about um, any number of things. So I'm going to make a motion that the board have a special meeting uh, for reopening um, this week. Is there a second? Okay, hearing none, we're moving on. I'll, um, I'll, second, that. I'll second that. Rod McMillian. Oh, okay. I'll second okay. that. Okay. Ms. Causey, could you please, uh, as we've been doing all night, put your motion into the chat so that I can restate it? Certainly. Okay, and I don't, yes, uh, and be as clear um, as possible because I'm, I want to make sure that I heard your motion correctly. Okay, I don't see it here yet. All right. Okay, so you, um, Ms. Causey, made a motion uh, to move that the board have a special meeting to address issues of reopening this week. So it was moved and seconded. And um, this is, so I just wanted to be clear, this is not the, in regards to the budget, um, it's asking to call a special meeting. And so, um, Mr. Bersades, we would need, um, the student member would be able to vote on this. Is that correct? Correct. OK. OK, so it has been moved and seconded to call a special meeting. Um, so uh, any discussion? Mr. Scott, Ms. Scott yes. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Mahomes has left the meeting as has oh. um, Ms. Joe. OK. So then it would be majority of the members who are present. It would be a majority of the full complement. 
So oh, okay. there would still be seven. Seven oh, needed okay. to pass. So it'd still be seven needed to pass. Got it. All right, um, Ms. Causey, may you speak to your, would you like to speak to your motion? Looks like you do. Thank I thought you, you already did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we have uh, a large number of staff that are uh, reporting next week, and there are, um, as indicated here, a number of questions. And earlier in the meeting, board members also had questions. Uh, we have new CDC guidance. We have um, issues with um, the uh, payroll vaccines. Um, also, there were questions asked about uh, the CARES funding, additional funding from the state superintendent, which may be $62 million uh, related to addressing some of these concerns and trying to really create uh, the best circumstance that we can for our students but also for our staff, because if we okay. don't have the staff we need, uh, we're not going to be able to provide the best uh, educational environment and opportunity uh, for our students. Um, okay. And uh, I just believe it's very important. This is mission critical, and we need to have time to be able to work through that as a board. Okay. All right. right. Chair, this is Lily Rowe. Yes, Ms. Rowe. I would like to amend a motion to specifically invite Ms. Cindy Sexton, who is um, asking for this meeting, to attend the meeting and participate in the discussion. So you would like to invite, Ms. okay, um, if you could state your amendment because it's, it, we're, we're combining statements with amendments and it's, I'm not clear, what is the actual amendment that you're adding to the motion? Um, I'm writing it now. Okay. I'll second it, Ms. Causey. Well, it hasn't been stated yet, so. Um, but I guess I want us to be very clear. And also, Mr. Uh, Mercedes, is that what, um, it sounds like what, what you're asking, Ms. Rowe, what you're putting in there is that you want to have uh, Ms. Sexton come in as a, as a board member to actively participate. Is that something as well, like how no, we have staff not come as a in? board member. Right, so I would like to amend the motion to invite Ms. Cindy Sexton, TAB co-president, to participate in the meeting to ask questions. Okay, so the motion has been stated. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Okay, sorry, I meant the amendment. Okay, so then um, we need to process the amendment. Are there any, is there any questions or discussions around the amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Henn. Okay, let me restate the amendment though so that I can make sure that it's the assembly. I apologize, Ms. Hen. Um, Ms. Rose said, I would like to amend the motion to invite Ms. Cindy Sexton, TABGO president, to participate in the meeting to ask questions. Okay, it was seconded um, by, um, by Ms. Hen. But Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Uh, Excuse me, I apologize. It's being seconded by Ms. Calsey, but I do have a question. Where is the amendment being added to the original motion? Because I see the original motion and I don't know where you want the amendment added. Um, hold on, let me look through this here. And, yeah, um, looks like the amendment isn't properly stated as I'm looking at it. Are you read? Um, because it looks like to have an amendment, if I'm if I'm correct, you can. And Mr. Mercedes, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You can add an amendment by striking or by adding. It looks like this is a second motion. Well, it, it's, it, it would be and invite Ms. Cindy Sexton, but, I, but the reason I'm adding it as an amendment and not a second motion is because if we don't have the special meeting, then there's nothing to invite her to. So the two things are connected. Okay, so then where would you like to add that? So um, reopening this week, comma, and to invite Ms. Cindy Sexton, TAB co-president, to participate in the meeting to ask questions. Okay. If you could put that in the chat so that I can properly state the amendment. 
and it is almost 12 o'clock at night. So <laughs> um, let's process this. Okay, and Mr. Mercedes, I just want to make sure um, that we're processing it the right way. So then uh, once I state that, then we're going to debate and then process the amendment and then um, process the main motion, correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. Okay, so Ms. Rose amendment is I move the board have a special meeting to address, well, I, I'm, I'm going to read the whole thing, but her amendment is to add um, after reopening this week and to involve in, invite Miss Cindy Saxon, TABCO president, to participate in the meeting to ask questions. So uh, the amendment was made by Miss Rowe and then it was seconded by Miss Causey. So are there any questions related to the amendment, which is basically adding the invitation to Miss Cindy Saxon? Yes, Madam Chair, this is Miss Hen. Okay, thank you. I knew there was some. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. <laughs> thank you. It's late. Yeah. <laughs> so my concern is that the issues that Ms. Sexton has raised are operational in nature and not of the board's purview. And while um, I would support this, I, my concern is that we are getting into the superintendent's territory and that these are issues that are really between Ms. Sexton and Dr. Williams. So for that reason, I won't be supporting the amendment because I don't support the original motion. So due to the scope, unless there's anything Mrs. Causey would like to clarify that she feels the board needs to address specifically. Okay. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. It looks like there's a question also from Dr. Hager. Um, I'm feeling very similarly to Ms. Hen um, for so many reasons, but one is that I, as of recently, this, or Dr. Williams, sorry, I'm tired too. Dr. Williams has yeah. been um, <laughs> has been uh, printed or on board docs listing all of our questions about reopening and the answers. Um, and so I know that there will be folks back in schools on Monday, um, but I, I I feel like on Tuesday getting those answers in writing thoroughly from every single person you know, without having it in a meeting, but in a Word document, you know, would be really useful. And so um, I don't know if even doc without making a motion, if Dr. Williams would be willing to answer some of TABCO's questions in writing. Um, again, you don't have to answer that, but we can ask as many questions as we want and get those answers in writing by Tuesday. So um, for that reason and the reasons Ms. Hen said, and just because it, I think it's going to be really challenging to get this on the books since it's midnight now and already Tuesday, um, I don't know that I can support it either. Okay, thank you for that. All right, Madam any additional Chair, questions about yes. the motion? Oh. Yes, Madam Chair, Doc, this yes. is Daryl Williams. Just want to remind the board that staff members, some staff members have been continuously working since March. We've had some staff members to return today um, and we have been in constant communication uh, with our unions um, we have representation on our design team um, and um, again based on the, the board motion that uh, we provide time for updates regarding reopening uh, we have done that uh, for every uh, open meeting session um, and I too worry about um, just the time frame of trying to get a separate meeting between now and next week. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Causey, you have a comment? Or we want to speak to your motion again? Yes, I want to speak to, to the, the amendment. amendment. Excuse me, to the yes, amendment. I, I want to speak to the amendment. And I agree that there is a separation of um, responsibilities uh, related to the board and the superintendent. Um, and one of the issues that, ha that we've heard that there was a motion, but it didn't pass, uh, but then we're seeing um, other boards addressing them is new things that are not, there is not a usual administration. So that it is something that it would be helpful for um, the board and the superintendent to have the discussion. Do we need to give uh, temporary uh, or stopgap authorization for accommodations for some teachers to stay virtual instruction? 
is there additional um, you know things that are needed related to the CDC updates in terms of our metrics and how we're portraying that and how we're processing that there so there are there are some gray areas and also as a board member I continue to receive hundreds of emails and there's some disconnect somewhere and so sometimes the best thing to do is to get the people in the room to talk about it and then and, and process it and then if decisions need to be made by the board with the superintendent's recommendation or input then we can get it done but the fact is is we have teachers coming and um some significant issues uh so i i, I think you know and as for the lateness of the hour and the time that needs to get done to be worked we have educators uh building operations folks our food and nutrition people everyone has been pitching in uh, we have people working at the vaccine clinics spending hours there um yes it is a lot of work but it is okay. worth it to try and make this the best experience for our students this is not business as usual this is not education as usual and so i think it deserves the time that it takes to make sure that when we start in person um, that we are doing it in the best way moving forward all right thank you for that miss Colsey. and again it is thank you for mentioning the lateness of the hour because it is quite late and i want to be respectful of everyone's time so um miss mack you have a question i just have a comment and a question um i share the concerns about when we would have another meeting because i know my schedule is pretty full but i do have a question in the absence of miss Causey making this motion what what were the plans if any to respond to miss um sexton's request for a meeting or to get her questions answered and concerns answered okay so that sounds like that's something that staff works with miss sexton and responds to her questions or, or things like that are you asking dr Williams? Well, i'm giving i'm asking specifically given the time frame that teachers are reporting back to the classroom um and there is a time component to this. When when was staff preparing to address the concerns that Ms. Sexton included in her letter requesting a special meeting? Ms. Scott, this is Ms. Lowry. I can address that. So Thank you. I heard, sure. I heard from um, Mr. Galante this afternoon, it was late, um, asking if we could convene a meeting to essentially discuss um, many of those points that were in um, Ms. Sexton's letter, as well as the guide, new guidelines, revised guidelines that came out on Friday from the CDC. And I did share with him that I would be more than happy to meet with him this week to review and discuss all of that. So we are right now, we have been working to try to both of us clear our calendars a little bit, but. Um, there will be a meeting it will be scheduled for this week um, to be able to address those questions and concerns and try to bring um, some level of closure to some of those. Um, I think some of those questions um, I will have to then circle back with Dr. Zarchin because um, some of the questions that are, are related to what came out on Friday from the CDC may need a circling back with um, both Dr. Zarchin and with Ms. Somerville, but um, we will give it the attention that it needs this week so that we can help to ensure that our teachers have a smooth reopening. Ms. Lowry, you could you um, speak to notifying the board of, of the outcome of those meetings? I could certainly provide you um, an update Friday in, in the update to let you know what we discussed and where we are with um, with the questions and concerns that they've brought to our attention. Thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Looks like there's a comment question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Although I <clears throat> um, support the idea of um, asking all these questions and getting some answers. Um, I believe that it can wait until next Tuesday when we will be talking about reopening and moving forward on the budget. So therefore I will not at this late moment in time be supporting this, this motion. Thank you. 
Thank you. So if we could now process the amendment and then the motion. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a, a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomsa? Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasteur? Mr. Kuhn? No. Do we still have a quorum? Yes, sir. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is three, opposed is five. Okay. Is four. Okay, yeah, I was gonna, oh, wow, apps, it is late, okay. Um, so um, it needed seven to pass, mm -hmm. if I understand it. So um, does that mean the amendment fails? Amendment fails. Thank you. Okay, and now if we could process the motion, could we do a roll call vote, please, um, of the motion? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is three, opposed is five, absent is four. Okay, the motion fails. All right, thank you for that. Um, and going around the dais uh, with board member comments, next we have is Ms. Lily Rowe. I have no comments tonight. It's very late and I'm just content to say thank you to everyone and for us to adjourn. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Rowe. And last but not least, it's me and um, I share everyone else's um, uh, uh, viewpoint. It is late, but I thank everybody for their commitment, their volunteerism, their time, and I hope everyone has a good evening. And so with that, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. So thank you all for joining us tonight and the meeting is now adjourned. Good night, good night. thank you. Good night. Thank you, good night. Good night.